seems to make them feel just fine. Hello, and welcome to the third episode of Name Five Albums. I'm your host, Abby Hanna. On this podcast, we'll be discussing music, musicians, and the influences that performers have on audiences, as well as the influences on both, which shape numerous different artists' creative work and subsequently social perspectives of our world. Now, if you've listened to the introduction episode of this podcast, you'll already know that I love classic rock. I love the super famous hits you hear at the end of your senior prom dance, like Don't Stop Believin', among others, you know. If you really know me, however, you'll know that my favorite musician of all time is hands down the ballad writing troubadour of late folk, Harry Chapin. If you don't know Harry Chapin, yes, you do. The song Cats in the Cradle was actually originally written by his wife and performed by Harry Chapin. You know, the song that Donkey sings in Shrek. Born in New York in 1942, Chapin took trumpet lessons as a kid, but eventually graduated to a sixth string when he was a teenager. From the early 70s to the end of his life in 1981, Chapin recorded a total of 11 albums, with each single he ever released becoming a hit on at least one national chart. A Grammy winner and Hall of Fame inductee, Chapin was best known for his ballads such as Cats in the Cradle, about a son struggling to bond with his distant father, then ending up exactly like him, or Flowers Are Red, about a little boy who was taught to paint flowers in one specific way, rather than however he wanted to, a meta-commentary on the suppression of creation in, an, in the American public school system. He even has a song about the wives of whalers during the mid-1800s, who never know if their husbands are alive at sea or not, called Dogtown. The majority of his discography is ballads, and each one he writes has a niche and unique story to it, from truck drivers to people giving guitar lessons to a sniper shooting down a local campus. However, he writes a number of songs, including some very sappy love songs. Only a few of them are remembered as much as other classic rock artists, probably due to the fact that he was more folksy, and the late 70s saw a turn towards less acoustic and more rock music. The most notable thing about Harry Chapin's career was his inspiration and mission to end world hunger. For each show that he played, no matter how broke or rich he was at the time, half and often more of the earnings he made went to local charities where he was performing, if he was even paid at all. He tended to enjoy performing for free. During these shows, he would stop doing his set to talk about hunger issues facing the American public. He even includes excerpts of these speeches in a number of his albums. He also helped create the Presidential Commission on World Hunger in 1977. Chapin died due to a heart attack during a car accident on the Long Island Expressway on July 16, 1981. Yet another example of a young face perishing during this time in American music, Harry Chapin lives on as an example of what musicians could be. Listening to him, you can just hear the guy is loving what he's doing. There's nothing he wants to be doing more than singing about what he's singing about in the moment, and he can get that across to you with very few words. He knew what it meant to be famous and set an example for all of us to use our fame for the better of everybody, while giving voices to stories that nobody else would. His gravestone in Huntington, New York, reads the lyrics of one of his songs, I Wonder What Would Happen to This World. Thanksgiving. Remember junior high school, high school, uh, elementary school, everybody bring any cans for the hungry people? Remember that? Just imagine if somebody, when you were in fifth, sixth grade, if the principal had the gonads to say, on Monday, children, it was the most single, wonderful outpouring of generosity that this school has ever seen. More cans of food feeding 193 families came to this school than ever before. We only have one problem and we're going to deal with it this coming week. We're going to cancel our regular classes and what we're going to talk about is what are those people going to eat next week? Now, that, doesn't that sound like a sensible educational system that dealt with those kinds of questions? His legacy lives on not only in our stereos, but in our society. It was his idea that brought to life USA for Africa as well as Hands Across America, both anti-hunger projects organized after his death. Today we remember Chapin for the work and inspiration he did for the fight against hunger. I'll throw in a few Harry Chapin songs into the playlist so you guys can start loving him as much as I do. On a lighter note, let's move to the next part. Today I have with me my next guest, Pete O'Hanlon of the Irish garage band Zen Arcade. Pete is also the former bass guitar and harmonica player for the four-piece rock band from Cavan, Ireland, The Stripes, with a Y. Not to be confused with The Stripes with an I. It's nice oh, to nice. see you in person. Um, Absolutely very nice to be here. I'm Abby. Um, Abby, Pete, pleasure to meet you. Yeah, pleasure to meet you too. Pete O'Hanlon, right? Um, Peter Hanlon, that's me. Yeah. You could, yeah, tell me a little bit about you. Um, you're from Northern Ireland, right? Yeah. Uh, hello, yes, my name is Peter, Pete O'Hanlon. Uh, I dropped the O years ago. And uh, yeah, I'm from, not from Northern Ireland. I'm from, so this is the, the this, it's a whole, it's a whole thing. So there's the, there's, oh, we've, the, Ireland's split up into four provinces. You've got Leinster, Connacht, Munster, and then Ulster. 
and then I'm from Ulster, but Ulster is divided up into Northern Ireland and then some counties are from the Republic. So we were, we were part of the ones that weren't part of Northern Ireland. Okay. So um, it's a weird grey area that we live in. But uh, yeah, a place called Cavan. Uh, it's, there's two interesting things about Cavan. Um, it has 365 lakes. So there's a lake for every day of the year. That's yeah, good. like exactly but, 365 or like give or give or take. But like, the thing is, the, the 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 standard of entry for these lakes, I think, is probably criminally low. I think they got to about 320, and we're like, let's bump this up to like 365 and make get a tourist angle out of it, because uh, some of them are just absolute puddles. But um, and also the book Gulliver's Travels was written in Cavan. Oh, that's, okay. That's the news. Yeah. So Jonathan Swift, I think, was holidaying here. I don't know if he wrote the whole thing or if he, but there's a blue plaque somewhere to say that Jonathan Swift finished a draft of Gulliver's Travels here. So that's that's important. And uh, yeah, I'm a musician. Um, I have been since I was about, uh, well, I started playing music when I was about six or seven or so after seeing uh, School of Rock, which I think was a formative moment for an awful lot of people. For all my professional credentials uh, and my the fact that I like to think that I'm a serious musician and all that, I did see School of Rock and go, I have to do that. I have to give that a go at least. And um, yeah, I was lucky enough to grow up in a town, quite a small town, where I had access to friends who were like into music as well. And how we started it, I ended up, yeah, we started out. Um, I met a chap called Evan Walsh uh, when I was about five or so, and me and him and a few of the friends, our, initially our relationship started totally non-musically, but we were just, we had a bigger interest in like film and that more so than music. And we used to film, we used to shoot, he would write and we would shoot and direct our own episodes of Doctor Who was our, was our big thing when we were children. That's, I think everyone has a dark Doctor Who past that they kind of uh, all started from. So we used to do that for years. I'm American and I do have a Doctor Who, pet, like it's of everyone, I think you have. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. The universality of the program is just, is just so far-reaching. But uh, yes, yeah, so we used to do that. And then after a while, and his his family were quite a musical family. His dad had been in bands. The thing was, we were lucky enough that there was just um, three or four of us started to really kind of refine our taste towards the music and things like that. And all our parents prior to that had been in kind of bands before. Evan's dad was was a was a bass player in a really good sort of Irish band that never really kind of made it, but had some really great singles called the Fireflies. And uh, my dad was in a few of the bands, he just like pub singer and also had done like, you know, sound design and technicians and things like that. The guitar, there was a chap we knew as well called Josh. His dad was a, was a big pub musician as well. The singer, then this guy called Ross, we started to get to know well. His mother was a singer, so we all had like sort of basic musical backgrounds and things like that. But initially I was not a very good musician when I started out. I was, uh, the thing was like, I, I'm, I'm convinced that I've managed to get myself into a position in my life now where I'm surrounded by people who are absolutely brilliant. And then I, by proxy, kind of look half decent. Um, but so when I started out, uh, I was playing guitar. I started to learn playing guitar and things like that. And I was told that <laughs> the guy I was getting music lessons off told my dad, uh, he's not very good. I'm only keeping him on because he's good fun in the lessons. That was it. He's like, he's, only, he's just, he's good crack to be around. So that's why I'm keeping him on. And the reason that's why I was friends with everyone and things like that for a good few years. And then, but I knew that he was going to play me. We were like seven, eight at this point. So it wasn't like we were like 15 years. Like we were really still young children. And he started playing with some, some other friends. And I was like, oh, I'm part of his film friends, but I'm not part of his music friends yet sort of thing. And then they asked me then would I, they were, we were in primary school, we were doing this thing. I don't know if you do them over in America, like Christmas concerts, like at the end of the, around Christmas time, they get kids like a talent show sort of thing, get everyone together and do that. Yeah. Yeah. So we, there had was a bit, like a, we had to do like naive like jesus scenes most mostly but like well, there would be, see, each each year a class would take they would like the teacher would be like we're going to do a scene from like our school was weird you do like oh we're going to do like the chocolate river scene from charlie and chocolate factory or we're going to do a bit of the passion of the christ it was always like that wide reaching but one year they said oh we're going to let up we'd set up this kind of small band or they'd set up the small band and had a slot at the christmas concert and all this stuff and we were about probably 10 or 11 at this point and they got me in to sing, not because I could sing, but because I would sing. It wasn't because I was any good, it's because that I would give it a go. And uh, it was a disaster. Our first, I remember our first set was like Whiskey in the Jar and Teenage Kicks and then uh, Knocking on Heaven's Door, which I think was ambitious for 11 year olds to try and do. I can, uh, I can picture that, like, wow, what a soulful number. <laughs> and, yeah, and me being 11, I, I remember my big, my big fashion, because we were called, at the time we were called, we called ourselves the Stripes and I remember I wear like stripy tops and then I as the lead singer was like, well, lead singers wear scarves. I've seen photos of Stephen Tyler. I would wear a stripy scarf as well. So clashing colored scarves was a mess. But yes, we did that. That was all fine. And then we just worked like, oh, that was, that was a bit of fun. That, that was grand, whatever that was. Um, and then we started, there's there this massive institution in Ireland called the Late Late Toy Show. There's a show called the Late Late Show. I know there's Late Late Shows over in America as well. But this is the longest running unbroken TV show of all time. I think it's its first episode was in like 1961 or something like that. And it's had loads of different presenters down to the years. It's kind of like the Doctor Who of, of like, late night chat shows which is like a different it's always the same show but it's a different presenter every few years um but every every they did this great idea where every november 
they would have a toy show where there'd be a show because it's a it's a political chat show. It's like a, it's like a current news piece of air show. It's kind of just a show that kind of does everything. It was the only in Ireland up until like a few years ago. There was only one television station, and it was the only TV show that was made in Ireland that was like a current news affair show and things like that. So everyone used to watch it. It had a massive listener viewership because it was the only thing you could watch on a Friday night. And then every November they sort of do this thing where they would um where they would bring children on and like review toys and just so the parents knew what to buy for the Christmas market and things like that. Um, and it was it was a huge thing that like it, it grew from like a like a ten minute spot in the seventies to like a whole episode every year would be dedicated to the late late toy show. And I'm not joking when I say this is the biggest thing on Irish television. Like the Olympics is big in Ireland, the toy show is massive. It's stupidly big. Something about maybe sixty percent of the population tune in every year to watch and things like that. Wow. And uh, got to the point then where they would like bring children on to review the toys of the year, and then so parents could see like oh, basically parents would watch their children watch the show, see what toy they react, and go cool, I'm going to buy them that. That works for Christmas, or well, that's what Santi's going to get them, that sort of thing. And then they started opening up to children could go on and do perform and things like that. And we ended up getting through an audition to then go and uh, to, to perform on to audition to be on the show. And uh, the first time we did it, I was still the singer, and it's one of still to this day one of my more professionally embarrassing things I did were. Uh, I had no stage moves. I was not a very concert performer. I wasn't a very good singer. Again, I was like, I don't know why I'm in this band. But anyway, we um, went up and our, the track we were doing was Rockaway Beach by the Ramones. And I think two other tracks, which I can't think of at the moment. But I remember the drummer's dad at the time was saying, just to give it a bit of like showbiz pizzazz, could yeah. you you could maybe do a Joey Ramone thing and like stand and hold the mic like this and do that for some of the gig, for some of the audition? And I was like, yeah, sure, that sounds, sounds doable. And I walked up, before we even started, I turned and held the mic at an angle and stood like that for the entire 20-minute audition until we left and put it back down. <laughs> Except I didn't get the, we didn't get the audition that year. Yeah, we didn't get the audition that year. But the next year, I was moved then to guitar. They realized this guy can't really play guitar. Then I was moved to bass. Uh, and we no sorry I was moved to guitar then we got an actual singer in who was a young chap called Ross who was only 12 at the time and uh, next year we got the audition and we did that that was we got on the toy show then and we played that year and it ended up being we, we did a like a homecoming gig as if we just came straight from the late late toy show we did a show in the market square in Cavan and there was a huge crowd there and it was all really good fun and that kind of like made the bands really, so kind of it was more of a, a more realistic prospect in our lives and then we kind of started gigging a bit more refined the taste a bit more like at the time our sets were absolutely ridiculous where it'd be like you know we were always into kind of like sort of 60s to the rhythm and blues and 50s or rock and roll stuff so it'd be like we do you know a kink song and then a yardbird song and then we do like you know an arctic monkey song and then we, we used to do theme songs as well we'd covered the ghostbusters theme song and we used to do uh the spider-man theme song um we we one of the worst creative decisions we ever made in our entire career was we used to medley I Got a Feeling by the Black Eyed Peas with Whiskey in the Jar by Tin Lizzy, which is like pretty bloody brave. But yeah, that's pretty much a small background to me. So in that the band I was in then the stripes, we ended up then about sixteen when we were about sixteen or so getting signed. We kind of ref, we obviously refined the taste further than just doing theme songs and, and art monkeys covers. I ended up getting signed by Universal and things like that and then ended up touring quite a bit and releasing albums to them and things like that. So that kind of uh, that went on for about six or seven years or so. We, we dropped out of school to do that, and that that was our kind of full time gig for quite a while. And then that broke up about two years ago or so. And then we started this new band, the Zen Arcade, that we're in that we're in now at the moment. And that's kind of that's been the last year. So that we 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 had start we announced that band in October of 2019, thinking right, it's time to hit 2020 hard. Here we go, we're all ready to go. We've been workshop on this band for six months over the summer. We've got loads of demos lined up. Let's get some shows together. Let's bloody well do it. And then obviously we all know what happened. What's going to gonna next, stop so. us, right? Like nothing. Exactly, yeah. So, but that's okay. Yeah, that, that's cool. So you've been like with another band, and then you guys kind of broke up, and then now you're in Zen Arcade. But you've always yeah. been around music, like obviously the toy show. The, wow, that's insane! Like it's I the most ridiculous like, clip as well. I'll send, I'll send you the link after. If anyone here wants to look it up, the stripes on the late late toy show. It's ridiculous. We're actual children at the time. I was like, I'm a, I'm an adult. I'm a fully grown man. I can do this. It's all fine. I am a genuine, absolutely, one hundred percent child on it. Uh, and it's it's ridiculous. And there's a re- yeah, it's it's a very funny clip to see because one of the guitars is out of tune. We're doing. I saw her standing there by the Beatles. One of the guitars is out of tune. I seem to think for some reason that I'm some sort of really soulful singer, and I start roaring and whooping and hollering and through the solos. It's all atrocious, but uh, it got us where we needed to go, so it was fine. Honestly, I think that's kind of a part like that's a really important part of like being in a band and being in a group and kind of like gaining no- notoriety and doing shows and stuff is like having a presence, you know, kind of like yeah. yeah. Standing on stage and playing music, and like obviously you guys rock at that, but like having a presence and like 
being yeah, you know yeah. not just, just singing into a microphone but like singing into a microphone and like it's just it's just horrible when you're like when you're cringy shit that you do as a 13 year old broadcast to the nation on, on one of the biggest show christmas eve like or in, in christmas the month of christmas like but anyway, yeah it was good fun to do and at the time it was great cracking it and even still now like we did a lot of different stuff with the band which are like we were like we did like we were on like David Letterman and we do toured quite a bit and we were like we played shows in Japan and all this stuff and still in Ireland everyone's like oh yeah you're the lads that were on the Toy Show ah yeah I remember that it's like we can't escape it here at all <laughs> which is kind of gas oh so yeah that, that kind of leads me into my like question of like do you have like a song or two that really just kind of like brings you back to childhood and kind of like being in that music scene in the Toy Show yeah I think well yeah because when when you said when you said, when you said childhood songs I always think of uh, my dad had two songs when we were very young he'd sing, he'd, he'd, he would sing two songs for us to get us to go to sleep sort of thing and one of them was like King of the Road by Roger Miller was his oh. like I don't know why I thought that was like yeah a really nice like, little lullaby track and then the other one was I'm a Believer by the Monkeys oh, uh, which that's yeah. So it was really nice. yeah, so King of the Road, I associate that so much with just kind of falling asleep at night and things like when I was very, very young. And um, the I'm a Believer version, so there's multiple different versions of I'm a Believer. So you've got obviously the, the Monkeys version, which is great. The Neil Diamond version, which is a really nice, soft, sweet song, which is great. You've got the Smash Mouth version, which like kicks ass. I, okay, because I was so confused. When I was a child, I would like hear I'm a Believer on, in like the car. Right? My parents would pe- play it all the time because they loved the Monkeys. And I was like, oh, this is a great song. But then I heard it in Shrek and I was like, wait a second. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Wait a second. Then I like found out about the concept of covers. I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. All right. I guess yeah. that's all right. But then I was like, you know what? The Smash Mouth version is a little bit more fun. You're so right. You're so right. Like, and I have to bet so many times I've got like purest friends who are like, you know, the monkey's version is amazing. And you're like, yes, it is what it is. But like the key the keyboard sound on the Smash Mouth version is it just obliterates the chorus. It's amazing. Uh, and there's, yeah. those, like those 90s like they go dun, 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 dun. like the 90s sound effect oh that's so good no, it's that's so and good. even then on, on the flip on the on the same note of that as well you've got obviously the big song with david bowie changes which is like a big classic sound to me but but i will say this butterfly boucher's version on the shrek 2 soundtrack is way better than the original to me i think it's incredible good. Oh she nails God. the she nails the chorus way better than I think Bowie ever did, which is a big claim. And something I don't say it to an awful lot of people because I will get like thrown out of rooms if I keep bringing it up. But I, I, it's it's correct. But I will say for the different versions of I'm a Believer, I will say my dad's a cappella Johnny Cash spoken word version is a fantastic version. I did not know that version existed. I'm gonna look. Well, he didn't. It, 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 no, he didn't record. He didn't release it. It was oh. one of those sung to me as a child. Yeah, no. So no oh, one has oh. never even been recorded. That's how he would do it. His approach was like an acapella, little like husky voiced version. And obviously, it was really boring because I didn't even. I never made it to the end because I was fast asleep when it did come around. But oh, moving on from that, I think other childhood songs. I mean, there was a the song I think of when I think of the because there was um there was about two summers or so I think between like 2005 and 2007 where I spent every single day in Evan Walsh's house. He was the drummer in the band that I mean him were very, very tight as children. I'm still obviously we have known each other I've known each other almost twenty years now, which is ridiculous. We met in nineteen ninety nine and it's twenty twenty one now. So it's like we've our relationship has now spawned four decades, which is kinda of gas. Um but yeah, so whenever I think of those that 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 summer where we where, where, where we hung out as much as we did then um for like every day those two summers in a row. Uh, Here It Goes Again by OK Go was the track that was all of us playing around the time. And to me, that as well is one of the best music videos, I think, for fulfilling the brief of a music video. It is the best. Because people are like, oh yeah, Subterranean Homesick Blues, which is an amazing video. And for the time, it's a great idea for a video and it's so different. Amazing. But for like fulfilling the brief and servicing the song as well as it can, I think the Here It Goes Again video absolutely is right up there, if not the best video of all time. I remember seeing that. Like, I remember that, like, honestly, listening to OK Go, they had that song and they had one other song. And I think those two music videos were like, oh my God, this is like creativity. Like this, I was like, this is the most creative thing I've ever seen. Cause it's, it's yeah. one take, right? Of all the treadmills. Yeah. Oh, I, I couldn't even have it to guess. And the thing as well is that it's filmed in a really dodgy, like digi cam. It doesn't look great. Like, it's a tin file backdrop. It's so cheaply done because when the idea is so rich and so full of inventiveness, it doesn't need to look that expensive. And even the bit that like gets me every single time is when they're doing the first course and they just start to do the ice skating as they go along. And that's the bit where I go, this is the greatest thing I've ever seen in my life. And that's what I love about that band as well is, is like, cause you do see, you see a lot of bands, I think you have like a careless approach to videos. You don't really care. And they're like, ah, who gives a shot? Like we'll just do a, perform- a, a performance video. Grand, that'll do, who gives a shot? They would, they would they value the video as much as the song, which I think kind of became a bit of their kind of undoing because then if you heard of OK Go releasing a new single, you'd be like, oh, I can't wait to see this great video. And the kind of the video started to kind of outshine the 
the music in, in the last few years, I think so. But at the same time, I still enjoy some of the tracks, are still great, and the service, the videos really, really well. But I think the videos have kind of become more of an art piece than actually the, the music has. I think because some of the videos they do would just exist if you put like hotel elevator music over, the videos would still look incredible. But that first one, OK Go, was I think was the perfect mix of like, here goes again, that, that video and that track, the perfect mix that like, I've never seen a video and song suit each other so well, and also just fulfill the brief as well as they did. They were just incredible. Yeah, and it kind of, that video really did become right, like in an era of pop music, like right after that music videos got really big and like high budget and like everyone started watching like Vivo or whatever. And that's kind of yeah. died down now, I guess. I don't know, I'm kind of older, but like maybe kids are watching music videos. I'm not really sure. But like, I love that because it's such a like, it's such a like epitome of like that era of YouTube too, where it was like, oh, okay, these musicians like, like, I, I don't know. I love that because it's clearly someone's basement. You know what I mean? Like, it's clearly like this yeah. guy was they, like, oh my God, what if we did this? And yeah, they, and I love as well that they, they definitely like had to ask a load of their friends, have you got any, have you got a treadmill? We need eight treadmills, where can we get them? Which I love. And that's even, you know, and I think you're right, but I think I don't know how, because I think there's, there's an appreciation for uh, low budget content now, I think, because I think because uh, people are quite smart, I think, as well. People don't you know, people know when they're being pandered to and know that, like, just because it's high budget doesn't mean it's, it's necessarily good, you know. And I think there's so many aspects of like film and TV that are, that are a testament to the fact that there's so many low budget indie flicks that are like incredible because the story's so good and things like that. And uh, that carries across in the music as well. And only recently, I was there's, a, there's an artist here in Ireland called Khaki Kid who released a video recently called Schlumped Up. He's a, he's a, he's a, he's a rap, he's a rap chap, it's a unifying term, but he's a, he's a, he's a rapper. And uh, music video, yeah, sorry, yeah. He um, he released a video there recently uh, for a track of his it's called Schlumped Up, but it's totally shot vertically. There's no, like, he showed me a cut, and I was like, this is vertical. And he's like, I was like, where's the widescreen cut? And he's like, oh, it's going to be fully vertical. I was like, really, a fully vertical video? And he goes, yeah, because if you, you can watch videos now on your phone on YouTube, if it's a vertical video and you watch it on YouTube and you like widescreen, it'll become full screen. And I was like, is that what videos? And he goes, yeah, that's what his videographer was like, the videos are going to be fully vertical now. And I was like, Sure, that's going to rewrite so many cinematic shooting rules because, like, you know, did you get like your, got your like, even like how panning works, how like uh, wow. composing a shot works? Yeah, for, I was like, that's fucking mad, but that's obviously how stuff's being consumed. Now. But the point being, I think, yeah, I think that the people enjoy like when an idea is good, they don't mind if it doesn't have, necessarily have the sheen. I think that that ties into as well. There's a genre of film I got mad into recently called Mumblecore. Did you ever hear of that? Mumblecore, no, tell me a little bit more. It's literally, it's like, it's a small little subset of sort of like. Um, I think Greta Gerwig came from it and things like that, and other guys like Mark Duplass and others actually came from there. It's these like the students would get like a two grand filming grant and would buy a terrible camera. And like it'd be all, some of these films are shot all in one room because they can only afford to be in one room and it's all very conversationally based because they didn't have the budget for like action sequences and things like that. But there's some really, really good interactions happening in them. And because it, it, it's so, some of it, some of them are so hard to digest because it's the, the, the sound is so bad or it's shot, it's all out of focus or whatever. But some of the stories are really good stories and they're worth telling just because just because you don't have the just because you don't have the means for them to be expressed to the fullest extent. They still deserve to be expressed in some way, shape, or form. And I think that's what's happening now with a lot of a lot of stuff now as well. Like you see a lot of bands and a lot of musicians that are doing like even like the lo-fi four track thing that people do now, where it's like really deliberately lo-fi and crusty sound. And even there's a band called um uh, um oh I can't remember the name. They're guided by voices. It's one of those bands that they put out like four albums a year and it's all recorded on really terrible Tascam four tracks that are that weren't that haven't been wound on, right? And the tapes all wobble as they play and things like that. I think there's a I'd much rather listen to something well written and badly recorded than badly written and well recorded. So sort of oh, yeah. you know I mean I enjoy really poor low quality content. And that's even like something that we do now with this new band we're in now. We do like a like a podcast and we do a fanzine every month as well. And we do like this tour diary series, it's all shot on this really crap camera from 2004 and it's like None of us are, well, there's one of the guys is a graphic designer, but I'm not, I, I do the magazine each month. I'm not a graphic designer. I don't know how to like do print features, podcasts. I've never really listened to a proper podcast before. I, like, I don't know how podcasts are meant to work, but we give it a go. I don't know how garage band works. It's a bit of a mess, you know. Um, the video, I'm not a very good editor as well, but like it just, I, I edit stuff that I think is kind of funny and if people like it, then it's kind of fine. I think there's, there's, a, there's an inherent charm that I think if, that you're robbed of when there's a, like a, a really slick sheen to it. And I think like, especially when you do this tour diary called Today Daylight like Today, that people seem to kind of enjoy, which is nice. And I, like the, and I say people, I mean the tiny pocket of people in the internet who give a shit about what we do. And it is tiny, but it's very, it's consistent and dedicated, which is what I like to say, which is like, which, what you say? Um, who I think because it's shot by us and it's definitely done by the band, uh, you're kind of, you feel kind of more involved more so than if it's, if they bring in like a, like a videographer to kind of do it. And so you immediately erect a barrier between the band who are being filmed and the person filming it and their their version of what the band are doing and then selling that to the people who watch it. You know, it's kind of, uh, it's a bit like I've seen tour diaries before where 
the, there'll be like establishing shots of the, the, the van driving or like grass blowing. You're like, I shouldn't be watching a nature documentary that is then about a van. You know, it should just be the van fucking about having a laugh. So I think which kind of thing. But anyway, that's that's all that to say. Um, I, shit, shit posting is fun, I suppose. It's a heel of the hunt, bit. But yeah. Yeah, I think that like people can tell, like, I don't know, it's it's funny to me, like a lot of, like I'm very like involved with YouTube and stuff. And like a lot of people are putting out like a lot of content every day just because like people are like, I guess they think their audiences like want more things and just want things, but they turn out like really, you know, bad quality sometimes. And then they're not like super fun to watch. But like, if you're doing like consistent uploads every day, you can't really focus on like increasing the quality of what you're yeah. actually posting. So like, yeah, I totally agree. I'd rather have like, like these dedicated fan, this a dedicated fan base who like enjoys the things I would put out, you know, yeah. even if it's like, you know, periodically, as opposed to like, yeah. oh, here's something for you today and tomorrow and like next week. And like, well, that's the, I think there's, there's people I know like daily vlogger people are just, it's, it's a crazy thing to try and keep up. And that's where you see so many like those, I think it was like, was it like two years ago? There was that massive burnout where just everyone stopped because it just, it was so hard to keep going. Like, and that's what I think I find what, what's, what's, a good like, marker to set yourself if you want to do stuff like this is to kind of set yourself a regular upload schedule and make sure everyone knows that like because we do this thing you know, we do the, the podcast that we do and the, which is higher fidelity and the, the zine we put out it's the first tuesday of every month an issue of the zine goes up and then the third tuesday there's like an issue of the podcast goes up so everyone knows midnight on monday as soon as it goes tuesday there'll be a new issue there or there'll be a new episode to listen to so we're not busting it's just every two weeks we have to get this together which is not insane uh, and it's it's easy and it's reliable and i find people i think mix up consistency with rapid fire output which is not the same thing and if people know i'm getting this at a certain day they're not going to be like when's the next thing coming because you know what well, i have to do is wait a week that's kind of fine you know whereas like if it was every day you can be like you just the the, the the rate of invention the rate of engineering you'd need to have to have something new and fresh and it'd be fun and engaging every day would just be way too demanding for a person to do and it's not conducive to actually living a life well, even i find that we've been doing this totally independently now uh, like in the band we were in before, obviously we were trying to do Universal and records and there was a lot of stuff taken care of. Like they would be like, oh yeah, we book your flights for you, we get your gigs, we book equipment for you, we get vans for you. It's really, like there's so much taken care of. And then doing this totally independently because that's what we kind of wanted to do because we had the, sort of the major label career for a few years. And we're like, cool, that's interesting. I'd like to try it our own way now. Um, just the workload is absolutely quadruple. And even now during the lockdown, it was fine. Because like every two weeks, is in, that's fine. A podcast episode grand. Even now when we're starting to do shows again and organizing tours and organizing releases and launch gigs and all sorts of stuff, having to do that and then this on top of it is just crazy. So people doing that full time and then uploads of every day and bands and all this stuff, it just, it's, it's, it's a ridiculous thing to try and put yourself through. And, you know, people can do it for like a year, maybe two years or so, but then at a point like I'm even realizing now at a point like we're not we're not we're kind of we're doing all right we're getting a few gigs coming here and there and things like that but I realize now like I put this framework of every second and th every first and third Tuesday something goes up uh, and even then we do like the tour diaries or that would go up periodically whenever whenever it's ready to go and then releases and all that as well doing all that was fine during the lockdown when I had every day to myself and could just do whatever I wanted except when I was working and things like that to now being like oh god we have to organize rehearsals we have to get like, organized travel we have to go away and it, I don't know how, it was a good plan to have when you had nothing else to do and now there's other stuff to do you're like Jesus okay how do we how do we parse it how do we pace decide that it's actually achievable and also the content doesn't suffer because we could just do like a quick episode and no one can give a shit and be like oh grand whatever could be, yeah you're funny oh whatever and then hang up and be done but I don't want like I don't want the individual I don't want the the, the, the faith that's been built up in the content being engaging and considered and fun to be taken yeah. away by the fact that it now has to just get churned out you know what I mean Absolutely. but I, all that to say all that to say go on no yeah I was gonna just gonna say like and you were saying before like people want authenticity and I feel like it gets to a point where it gets kind of hard to even like put out this 10 minute chunk of like quote unquote your day or whatever like your music when it's not really you because you're just like burning yourself out trying to produce this content but what, yeah absolutely but, Totally. How have you found yourself doing the whole YouTube crack? I know I was watching your video. That's why I came across your channel. I, came, I was looking up Paul Simon stuff because I was on a Paul Simon binge and came across your cover of really? Subside No Way. That's why I came across it. Yeah, which, it was like two weeks ago or something. And yeah. then I was like, what, what channel? Yeah. And then I was like, what channel is this? And I saw you were doing like a review of Jennifer's Body. And I was someone who's doing like Paul Simon covers and then reviewing films. That's the kind of like incongruent content that I look for in channels where it's like there's no telling what's gonna be and that's what I'm like that I kind of enjoyed that and then I came across it on TikTok and was like oh god that's the same person that channel oh shit that's kind of cool but uh yeah no Jennifer's body review sided with like a Paul Simon cover like that's a channel that like I need to know about because that's the fucking that's the kind of like the sort of really incongruent stuff that I enjoy doing online which is kind of nice yeah I mean but, I uh, yeah, no, a, yeah that's like the kind of niche I like to take is like well people are like uh because I'm like on TikTok a lot and somehow I got like 20,000 followers and people are like oh you need a niche oh you need a niche I'm like no need a niche like you don't that doesn't no no no, no. Yeah. you don't need anything like you could do yeah. say, talk about whatever you want honestly online yeah um, well that's not like, even like the, the sorry, on, sorry. 
No, no, I was just gonna say the, po- the, the podcast we do, like again, it was like it started off as like a we have segments and we discuss, we like we want to show off our musical knowledge and this is what it is, and, like, and then it turns into like dissecting the outfits from like Mary Kate and Ashley films. We're like, how did we get here? We're like six episodes in, or like it'll be a deep dive discussion of why Spider Man Three was flawed but also fun and shit like that. Like it's always you end up like descending into just the nonsense conversations that end up, end up happening with those that are crack. But anyway, sorry, go on. You but yeah, so yeah, so this is like kind of the next part of it. I kind of like one of my things with this podcast is kind of. Um, like, when I was little, I was, like, you know, very in the classic rock. I would, like, only listen to the Beatles. I was, like, no one can cover the Beatles. And, like, the Beatles are great. And, like, I only like them. And I hate One Direction. You know what I mean? I was, like, I hate Ed Sheeran. I hate all this pop music. But then I, like, kind of, like, you know, I got into a little bit of pop punk music for, from, like, a mashup I found online. And then yeah. I was, like, oh, maybe music is, like, better, like, in other categories as well. And maybe it's good <laughs> today, you know? <laughs> So when I was like 14, 15, you know, I became like this like pop muse. I was like a one directioner. I didn't really become like a Justin Bieber fan. I kind of skipped that whole thing. But like, you know, along like going through high school, going through college, I was like, oh, you know, like I feel like I missed a lot of music when I was younger because I would just be like, <clears throat> like, no, you can't cover that. Like, oh, you can't do that. So like, did you grow up like kind of not liking any music at like a genre or like a certain thing? And like, have you changed your mind on it now? Like, how do you feel about that? That's the, the parallels there are absolutely terrifying because there was when we were starting at the band first, we were just like in the most because Evan's house is a really like Beatles sort of house, and we were just yeah. it was an absolute Beatles bubble, and it was like anything to do with them was great. Like, I remember I when I was about maybe 10 or so, I asked Evan, like, who's the Beatles' like, biggest rival? And he was like, oh, probably the Stones. And I went, okay, so I hate the Stones, and I never really listened to the Stones, because they're the Beatles' rival, and the Beatles are my boys, so I like all that sort of stuff. But yeah, no, totally, you're, you're totally right. Like, again, I had that thing where I was, well, when I started playing music, I had no idea what I liked. I just knew I wanted to play guitar. Yeah. And then I was like, shit, people are going to start asking what music I like. What am I going to say that I like? Jesus Christ. And for about a year or so, because I'd be like, I play guitar. And like, what do you play? And I'd go, interesting question. Very good question. Let me get back to you on that. Um, but yes, yeah, so when we started playing, it was always like, I remember we, getting Beatles rock band was a huge watershed moment. We just, that's all we did for like an entire summer was play Beatles rock band. And um, so that was, yeah, so there's been lots of Beatles house, but we, like, we, we did um, through that then, so we, uh, we were always, the, the Beatles was like a big jumping off point for all of us. That's we, myself and, and Evan and this, the guitarist in the band, Josh, and, and two other friends who were in the Stripes first with us, we just were absolute Beatles fanatics, Beatles nuts. You couldn't stop us like being massively into the Beatles, just that was all it was. And then we kind of branched out off into like the Who and like the Yardbirds and the Animals and the Kinks and all those other bands that go along with that. And then through that, then because a lot of those bands have had like sort of rhythm and blues roots, we started to like go back and we're like, cool, okay, what? Instead of like a lot of people, I think, took like the Yardbirds and that was like a jumping off point to go into Zeppelin and go into the 70s. Around. We weren't like, oh no, let's go back to the 50s. We were like, oh shit, this Bo Diddley guy, this up and coming guy, he's really cool. And uh, we're like sort of huge, got like onto a massive sort of blues binge. Then there was like the likes of people did, they obviously Chuck Berry things that he was more sort of rhythm and blues. And uh, like you couldn't stop us into like Big Bill Brunzi and like Charlie Patton and like Lead Belly and Sunhouse. We got really into the sort of 30, 40s, 50 stuff. And we're just absolute fanatics for that. And that then, through that, so we went to like 60s back to the 50s, 40s, and then forward to like the sort of 70s. You had like the, the, there's a lot of those like 60s British invasion rhythm and blues bands, like, like the Yardbirds who were, and like, the Kinks and, and and even the Pretty Things and the Animals that were doing covers of Bo Diddy stuff. For months. And then they sort of started to inform uh, sort of the 70s sort of pub rock thing as well that sort of happened pre punk with a band. It was a band that we, we got absolutely riotously obsessed with called Dr. Feelgood, who they could cover like Little Walter and, and these sort of like these old sort of 50 standards. And uh, we just got absolutely fucking obsessed with them. And that's, so we, we, were like a, a, we were like a blues purist band. We were like, if it's not blues, if it's not three chords, that's just it. That's just not, it's, just, it's not worth listening to. And again, and I, you know, I was, I think, I think you were talking about the question, like, these are stuff they listened to back then that I kind of that I ignored. I kind of, we, we were so mad into that that I neglected everything else, even though I, I subsequently had, like, while all that was going on, I also had a little, like, secret, kept it away from everyone else after the yeah. pop, pop punk six months that like just destroyed my body and soul where I, I got so and again it's, it wasn't even the good end of the pop punk like you've got sort of the credible end like your Blink 82s and you're like your Sum 41s and all this sort of yeah. I was a Bowling for Soup fan I was oh, so I big into Bowling for Soup they're yeah, amazing so they're so fun and the thing was I was kind of a I was kind of a large-ish teenager so I just I identified with the big guys and Bowling for Soups so like this this is music for me now and uh, I, I kept I, like I remember thinking like yeah you know what high school really does never end like it yeah. really doesn't. 
Oh no, it was just it was, the one for me was Punk Rock 101. That was the track for me that I absolutely adored. And they had um they did a cover. Now this is we're getting into the sort of pretty niche stuff here, but they did um they did a cover of Melt With You at the end of the Sky High soundtrack. Do you ever see oh, Sky High? Yeah. They that, oh my god, that was them. That was them. They did that cover of Melt With You. It was amazing. Did so yeah, it's, okay. it, yeah, have you seen Phineas and Ferb? Yes, uh, I know they did they did the theme song for that, song? yeah. But they also do the love handle song, Snuck Your Way Right Into My Heart. That's Bowling for Soup as well, to do that one. Snuck you, oh my Way God. Way right into, yeah, amazing. And the solo on that, incredible. Great. Again, there you go. It's like music, again, I couldn't, at 12, I was like, I'm loving this Phineas and Ferb track, but I cannot tell my blues purist friends that I like this. Even though the thing was, a few years later, we were all like, hey, so I liked that at that time. They're like, oh my God, yeah, me too. We were all like lying to each other, being like, yeah, no, we're all blues purists. Like, it was not big, big brooms. You think, get the fuck out of my house, things like that, yeah. you know what I mean? But uh, so we were mad into that. And then the thing is, like, it's weird kind of my relationship with that music changed an awful lot. Then as I got older, then I kind of uh, was like, I, again, I'm not to discredit the art form of like the blues and all that at all. It's the base of a lot of the music that's going around now. But I think I got all I was going to get out of it. I was kind of like, you know, I really, at the time, I really enjoyed the predictability of it's just three chords and the jamming potential that was there was just phenomenal. And the thing was, we we would jam for like 45 minutes to like an hour and go to as many as we could and sing different courses. And it was great for playing live. And there was up in Dublin at the time when we would go when we were from Cab and we'd go to Dublin to play shows. There was a lot of bands there that were like, could do that as well. So it was very easy to jam and get all the bands up on stage and play together for a bit because it was like, oh, we're playing in G, cool. Like, I can play that, no bother at all. Yeah. And we had this, it's where, and it's the best genre to play to develop a sort of uh, telepathic relationship with like a, all the musicians. Really, like, I can tell. Like, they've got to the point where, like, me, me and Evan have been playing together for I was like, probably about fifteen years now. Where I can tell, oh, I can tell by the way he's playing, what type of fill he's going to do next, and I can play with that. And that all came from just jam and blues stuff for youngs. But then the music I get into then as I get older, sort of by by going into the pop rock stuff, that led on into the late 70s, sort of like new wave, stiff record stuff with like Elvis Costello and Nick Lowe and this sort of like power pop stuff started to creep in. And there's way more sort of craft involved in that, which I started to appreciate way more in terms of like lyrical content, like dense lyrical content that also has, you know, a, a surprising middle eight or like a sharp left turn that you weren't expecting, which you don't get in a lot of the blue stuff. Uh, so in, in essence, I would say my relationship with that changed quite a bit. And then, you know, I think at the time, as we're back on the flip side of that when I was younger, I denied myself a lot of music that I was liking, like like, like the pop punk stuff and things like that. Like I denied myself, I said to myself, I can't like that because of my my image of wanting to be like, again, I was 14 going, I need the world to know that I, I am a blues man, right. even though I was an absolute, absolute chuck. I had all my Beatles t-shirts. I was like, I'm not buying a One Direction. I can't buy a One Direction shirt. That's terrible. Yeah. Well, that's even the thing is, like, you know, we all had the share of bringing of like loving like McFly and things like that who were, you know, yeah. and busted and all those sort of bands. And it was only when I hit like 17 or 18, it was like, actually, it's just stuff I enjoyed as a teenager. It's fine. We're all cringy bastards anyway. And then, you know, would say to them one of those, like, oh, this, this, I put it on in the van, but it's kind of sounds a bit fun, isn't it? And they'd all go, oh, I remember this. Yeah, this was great. Crack. Oh, and I go, why, why, why did I deny myself that for years? We could have had so much fun listening to these tracks to the point now where I've absolutely destroyed my music taste to the point where I almost exclusively listen to like, uh, you know, Kelly Clarkson now. Like, it's a mess. I've, I've gone from such lofty heights to such grisly, grim lows. Like, you know what I mean? Even I was listening to Jesse McCartney a few days ago. Do you remember him? He's getting, Beautiful soul. He's, seriously, he's like performing again or something around here. Like, I don't know. I don't, I like missed the hype or something, but someone was like, Jesse McCartney's back. I'm like, what? What do you mean? I just, I just remember him from that one episode of Sweet Life of Zach and Cody. That was like, that to me cemented his thing in me so much. But yeah, so that's the thing. So like on that question, yeah, so they kind of, I've definitely like sort of, I've not abandoned my blues roots, but been like, I've kind of, I've done as much as I can do in that field. And then like at the time was like, I cannot, I cannot say that I like Bottle for Soup. Whereas now I sicken everyone I know with the fact that like I used to love Bottle for Soup and I still do now and just, you know, that this is what it is. And it's like, yeah. it, I think it's nice. You hit your kind of, because I think in your in your teen years, you're kind of like, I need to establish myself as an adult who like knows what they're talking about and I have to have other stuff. And once you hit post 20 and you go, just taste is what it is. You've no control over what you like. Just like what you like and it's fine. You know, that's kind of, it's a really comforting moment to go, oh, I am actually pathetic. It's fine to listen to this pathetic music because I am who I am and that's what it is what it is. And oh, it's, yeah. it's very liberate. It's very liberating and fun to be to just to, to dissolve all your years of built up musical pretentiousness and go like ah you know what I am put on you know since you've been gone again you know oh yeah like that that's the thing like behind these like I would yeah honestly Kelly Clarkson is a great example of like like she's not an embarrassing 
person to listen to. It's just like, she, she'd never be the first person I'd bring up. You know what I mean? That like, oh, I love, I don't, I've never heard anyone honestly be like, oh, I, my favorite artist is Kelly Clarkson. You know what I mean? Just the, like, the never, it, it, she never is. Either. But even like stuff like, you know, the stuff I love, the like potential breakup song by like Ali and AJ and crap like that. That's sort of just stuff that I... Dang it. Yeah, it's exactly. And it's nice to have these conversations where you're like, you know, oh, how are they going to react to this? And everyone always goes, yeah. like, here's the one for me is like, you know, Phil Collins is like a big artist, big respected artist, platinum, multi million album selling, Mamas and Genesis, other. His best album ever is the Tarzan soundtrack. That <laughs> is an incredible hard. piece of work. It's an incredible <laughs> piece of work. It, it's better than Genesis, who are one of the biggest program fans ever. I'm like, yeah, but. Genesis didn't write Son of Man, did they? No, I think he did that for the Tarzan soundtrack. A film about a man who thinks he's an actual monkey. And the soundtrack's incredible. Like, it's amazing. And I've thought that for years. And it's, it's weird seeing this stuff kind of creep through online. Where like, I remember there was this thing a while ago, I kept seeing sort of memes out about it, about like, you know, Phil Collins writing the Tarzan soundtrack and it'd be like, looked like fire shit. And I'm like, I've thought this for years. It's so nice to find out there's like pockets of the internet who like agree. It's amazing. Um, yeah. But yeah. Yeah, so that kind of like, are there still kind of, that's kind of like one of my thesis statements with this whole podcast is that like I used to be like oh there's people would ask me like what my guilty pleasure music was and I'd be like oh you know like like Zayn Mel you know I'd be like Zayn's album like whatever I'd be like oh, whatever but now I'm like I don't think there is a such thing as like guilty pleasure when it comes to music because like no. that's the whole thing but like so, you know for me so it's it's kind of hard I'm trying to be so open. Like I listen to so many more genres of music. I listen to like also just you know, Portuguese music and like haven't quite gotten into K-pop or anything like that yet, but I'll get there. Um, yeah. But I've been, um, let's see, like one of the thing is like, do you have any songs or like, for me, I, I, I can't for the life of me get into like stadium country music. I can get into like old Dolly Parton, like, yeah, I guess it's like, more like folk, but like, like old folk country music kind of stuff, but like stadium country rock I really cannot get into that doesn't mean when like the kiss a girl by Keith Urban comes on I don't rock out to it. you know what I mean um, but like is there any song or genre that you just like you can't really get into at all like yeah well I think just on the on the on the stadium country rock thing Ireland has such a weird network of that as well we call it country and Irish where it's just there's it's same there's the same sort of like just uh, like production line of like singers coming out like they all it's the same 20 songs they all do them and like there's it's like Derek Ryan and Nathan Carton these boys here and they absolutely pack out venues up and down the country every night of the week it's crazy and it's the most sterile version of what true proper country music could be and again same thing I'm like classical country stuff I think is amazing like there's people that are like, I mean, there's contemporaries now that I think are really good and really uh, sort of um, conventionally uh, sort of standard but also like have an edge to them that I think is what country needs to sort of be country it needs to have kind of an edge to it and when it doesn't when it's just kind of shiny and, and rounded it kind of loses itself but, but Ireland has a massive culture that, and it's just weird that I think it's another like weird Irish-American link where like it's just this, this undying obsession because even there's people I know who are like younger than me who are teenagers who'd be like oh, yeah I'm going to go see like a man in his 70s sing Wagon Wheel you know like Daniel O'Donnell is one of the biggest selling artists of all time and he does all that stuff so yeah that's all there but um, no yeah so there's a genre music that I think I can't get into and I think it's it, it it's proven divisive quite a lot like um i'm you know i have my classic rock pretensions that i enjoy like i enjoy bands like the who and things like that but i just i can't handle it, it sounds, it's, it's weird to say about having like a musician's background and things like that, but like virtuosity i don't really find that impressive like people doing like 11 minute long solos and things like that i never find that impressive because like it's just it's, it's not it's not tuneful it's not it's kind of it's because what I respect in songwriting, what I respect in music, what I respect in music is like the craft of songwriting in terms of like being efficient with your arrangements and being efficient with your bits and being like there's you know, this riff for two bars just so that to lead us into this nice bit here and just like it all weaves around really nice things that songs that are just kind of like oh yeah we just let the guitarist rip for six minutes that to me is like stuff they're not really that into and I think one of the one of the one of the worst sort of purveyors of that and again it's 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 you know it's not it's not fun to hear for a lot of other people I'm not like Zeppelin to me I just I could never could never break through to Zeppelin. You know, there's songs there that I, that I would like, but I kind of, it's it's so sort of overwrought and I think sort of bloated and kind of, for want of a better phrase, up its own arse a tiny bit. Uh, like, I think the, their, their initial roots were great. Like, I think because they, they stemmed from the Yardbirds. They, initially, Jimmy Page's first term, for the first name of the band was the new Yardbirds. And, you got, and again, they're all amazing musicians right. in their own field. They're absolutely incredible things that. But just, it's like the fact that the, the track Moby Dick exists, which is 23 minutes long, uh, to me, it's just, you know, it, it's so beyond what I think I listen to music for, which yeah. again, isn't to discredit isn't to discredit the artistic significance of a band like that. I'm not saying that at all. Just to me, it's just not to my taste. Even saying like, there's this, you know, 
Stairway to Heaven, I've never heard the whole thing. It's not a track I've ever got to say, like, I was just going to bring up, I think it was only like about three years ago I was thinking about it. I don't think I've ever heard the end of Stairway to Heaven. No, no. I've never heard the end of, and it came on the radio the other day, and he go, and he was like, it was the end of the song. And I was like, oh my God, I've gone like 23 years, and I've never heard the end of this song because I was like, no, I'm bored. I don't want to listen to the rest of it. Yeah, and the thing is, well, it's like, I think if you have to make an active show, because like, I'm all about music challenging people, definitely, I think that's really important. But also, if I have to, like, if it's hard for me to listen to it, then this music is failing, you know? Right. Like, where, whereas, you know, there's a... There, I find songs that are simple and monotonous that go on for ages. I think, great, like, there's a, there's a, a track I think is amazing because it's such a weird artistic risk to take. It's by an artist called Laurie Anderson, she has a song called Oh Superman and it's eight minutes long and all it is is her speaking into a vocoder saying Oh Superman, Oh Mom and Dad and it's the, the, the rhythm is like set to like the, the sound of a heartbeat and things like that. It just, it shouldn't have been, it was a small hit, it shouldn't have been a hit. It's an amazing track and it's, it's longer than Stairway but to me I'd listen to that quicker than I would listen to Stairway to Heaven because it's just, I think what, what kind of wrecks me ahead of a little bit of Zeppelin as well is the kind of the whole, the whole like we're, we're, we're getting symbols involved, we're getting into the occult stuff of like it just it all seemed very like they set the benchmark for what sort of classic rock arena rock bands did but also, excuse me, oh my god, but also that to me I just didn't find those bits ever cool, you know like they only put the Beatles things, they all going to India, that was kind of cool and they did this and that was kind of cool and they all, they all grew mustaches, that was kind of cool. The right. group moves that Led Zeppelin did never seemed kind of cool me. and even that's something as well like there's you know when you think of the Beatles in terms of like revolutionizing songwriting and, and, and production and, and what music could do what music could achieve in the world and things like that they'd never had an album that was longer than like 35 minutes except for maybe the White Album like every album was you know even Sgt Pepper I don't think breaks the 30 minute mark you know I could be wrong there but they have albums that are like fucking 28 minutes long and every time they came out it was a huge moment worldwide when the Beatles album came out but they were so short, they were so inventive. There's a lot of the singles barely break three minutes. You know I mean, it was rare for that to happen. But still, they were, they were able to do so much. And I find it way more impressive if a band can do an awful lot in two minutes and ten seconds than they can do it in eight minutes. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. And on the on the flip side of that as well, there's a band I really like, I think they're called Percussions now, but they were called Viet Cong originally. I think they changed the name for kind of obvious reasons. But they had a song called Death, which was 19 minutes long. So like if you're gonna have I'm kinda like if you're gonna have a long song. Don't if it's five minutes, it might as well be twenty. Don't like yeah. don't, if you're gonna if you're gonna go long, go mega long. Except for Moby Dick, because I do not like that song, Moby Dick. But <laughs> Honestly, I think yeah, it's way more impressive. Sorry. No, go on. Oh, one of well, I was gonna say one of my favorite songs is by I don't know if you've ever heard of Harry Chapin before, um, no. but he was uh, actually it's another Shrek reference. But no, I'm kidding. Um, but you know, Cats in the Cradle from. You know, oh, sorry, Harry Chapin. No, I do. I didn't know the Cats in the Cradle. I, just, I was when you said Chapin, I thought Cho, Chopin. I was like the, the class, fucking classic mm-hmm. guy. No, Cats Everyone's in the Cradle. Like, yeah, no, great. Everyone's either like, oh, Harry Chopin, or like, oh, Harry Chaplin. I'm like, no, 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 Harry Chapin. Like, it's fine. Chapin. Yeah. But he. No, has, I didn't know. I know Cats in the Cradle. Yeah. <laughs> he has a song called um, "There Only Was One Choice," and that song, like, it's a 14 minute long song, but like, he changes it completely. Like there's, it, it, it's a comp, it's a composition of basically five different songs. And it's just like, part of it is a ballad. And then part of it is just like the drum solo crash out of that ballad. And then just him kind of like musing to himself for two minutes. And then he brings the band back. in. It's just such a great, like, yeah. and you're, you're there, you're listening to it. And you're like actively like yes. enjoying listening to it. Whereas when I was listening to Stairway to Heaven or something like that, I'd be like, all right, like, I get it. <laughs> you know, yeah. like, I, you're totally, you're totally right. And that's a, that's the same. There's a, there's a, a Who track that's on the end of the album called "A Quicker Mile Is Away." Same thing. It's like a nine minute long song, but it's a mini opera. It's like a, it, there's a story that links to all the songs. And the thing is, each track doesn't last for longer than maybe like a minute and a half. And it's all the thing is, and I think that's the big difference with like long tracks. Is that it's con- same with the Harry Chapin. Like it's consistently engaging. There's new elements coming in, or there's stuff being taken away to keep it going. Whereas there's like you know, like I, I you know, I, I there's there's like lead guitar and there's bands who are like you know, oh yeah, have you seen this Stevie Ray Vaughan clip? No, I like Stevie Ray Vaughan. I like Rory Gallagher. They're all great. But they will do like, I will just solo for ages. And you're like, I don't find it impressive when I can just see someone just tap shred for for young. Because that's not really what I listen to music for. I forget what we do it. And like, there are moments that I think are great and there's solos that are great. But there's yeah. the, the, the solos that I adore are solos that like service the melody or are just are a part that was written. Like there's an amazing solo in a squeeze song called Another Nail in My Heart. And it's, it's the weirdest placement for a solo as well. It's it goes verse chorus straight into the solo and the solo is like really impressive but also has a really lovely sweet melody to it and services the song really really well whereas there's other songs from like you can tell the band wrote the song and we're like okay guitarist you just let rip and he's not even playing in time with the band or it's just going crazy and you're like that isn't as impressive to me and a guitarist who can play really really well 
mm-hmm. and can do the shredding and chooses not to and, and like you use their powers for good rather than evil and you know actually write a really kind of decent melody around the track that's more and the, the solos I, I adore across the globe across the entire spectrum of music are solos it's just diverse melody again but plucked on a guitar they're to me they're to me because if, if you trust the, if you trust the melody enough it should work across multiple multiple different instruments and if it does then you're on a winner then you know what I mean Exactly. I was like, you know, I've always felt like there's a reason the song, like, not not everyone is like a huge Journey fan, but everyone knows Don't Stop Believing." Like, that song yeah. goes, it's so weird because that song goes like verse, and then it teases the chorus, but then it goes like verse, and then it, and it does the solo, and then you're like, damn, and then it goes Don't Stop, and I'm like, wow, every time I hear that yeah. song, I'm like, this is a genius, like, conglomeration of all the perfect things that you need for yeah. a hit song <laughs> like absolutely and and then it's funny you mentioned that as well because there's you know, you know the track there she goes by the labs yeah that, that, that's yeah. yeah of course again i again I, I there's so many of my favorite songs in the world that i've come across through films that's in parent trap you know when she goes to london she, 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 they're walking across the abbey road and they do the yeah but that song if like I, I've, I've spent way too much time listening to that song considering it is just a two minute little fun song from the late 80s um it is there's no verse in it at all. It's four choruses in a row and a riff twice. There's no, so the thing is, they were just, I don't know if the band were like, this chorus is so good. We don't need any verses. If they were just like, eh, the song is what it is. But it's one of the things where like, if the chorus is that good, you don't need a verse interlinked. I mean, you can do the chorus as much as you want. It sounds amazing. You know what I mean? It's re- and again, one A minor change halfway through, songs are totally different. It's the same chords again. It's like, it's one of the things where like just every essence of it that need, that need, that was there to need to make it successful was already there at that point in time. It was just the same as the journey thing as well. And like, it's a total flip end of that journey thing. There was no thought for it. It was just, we have all these choruses. We whack to them as much as we can. Let's throw the riff in every now and then. Boom, one of the most heartbreakingly, potently beautiful love songs ever written. But also it's about heroin as well, which is kind of grim. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> Racing through my veins. Oh, yeah. Exactly, yeah, exactly, yeah. There's another one, there's another tracker actually on that as well. It, it, it sounds like a love song, but it's actually a heroin song. Is Another Girl, Another Planet. Do you remember that track? No, or the only seen. ones. It starts with a guitar solo, which is a great guitar solo as well. And also Blink-182 do a pretty decent cover of it as well, which is worth checking out if you do want to uh, dive back into the pop punk thing. But um, okay. yeah, no, I think simplicity music, I find way more pretty. Yeah, it, that's, a, that's a long way around from answering your question of just, I don't I don't like sort of bloated over rock music that goes on. It, music that I'd say is welcome and demands you to kind of like struggle along with it. It's not what I can listen to music for. I like short songs to get in and they get out. And do what you need to do, and kind of leave leave you wanting more, more so than that, wanting you to switch off, sort of thing, you know. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, so um, yeah, we're kind of getting into you know like the big, bigger questions here, but uh, kind of like so. My first thing is uh, you know how much we've talked a little bit about like you know like liking music for other people, like oh having to project this image of yourself and like kind of letting go of that, but like how much do you think now like the people you meet like, kind of influence your music? overall like your pure, the thing that you create yeah well i think yeah that's you know throughout my entire life I mean, music a lot of music has come from the friends that i've had around each other like i think you know even still to this day and now the, the two people that i'm in the band with i'm currently with now were the people i was in the band with before um, evan and ross and we even when we were like 15 16 we'd already been hanging out for 10 years at that point because we'd only just been like four and five um and there was always like a kind of uh, like i didn't get into a band like if I, it was kind of one of the things where like if they'd get into a band, they'd give your friends come and say, oh, I've heard this new band. And you go, oh yeah, I'll, I'll check them out, whatever. You know, you kind of, you're kind of like, ah, whatever, that's your thing, I don't want to give a shit. Um, I think we now, and even at the time as well, it was such a weird sort of like subconscious trust in each other's taste because we were so linked by, by a lot of our like sort of experiences and through playing music together. That like, I was like, I respect their taste so much that if they like this band, I should probably give them a really decent whack and see if I like them as well. And now those bands have come to define us professionally in an awful lot of the weird ways. Like where, you know, we got mad, Evan got mad into the Yardbirds and he came into me and was like, oh, there's, there's this band that had Jeff Beck and Eric Clapton and, you know, Jimmy Page in the band. And I was like, oh, yeah. that's a bit weird. So then we listened to it and then we both went, we had absolutely like fell down this absolute like spiraling rabbit hole of we are obsessed with this band together. And what's, what I think is really fun, and same with Ross and Doris as well in the band, we all just got obsessed with the Yardbirds. Uh, and it's really fun to be like, it became like an arms race. Like, who's going to find the next band next week to be like, this is the band we listen to. And then everyone jumps in that band for ages. And then you spend the whole weeks in the van talking about this track and this track. And it's a really fun way to explore a band when you feel like, if I don't find this track and give it to them, then I'm going to feel bad if they give it to me because I want to be the next one to find the next track or the next band. So it's kind of it's a really nice way to do the work. Same with that band, Dr. Feelgood. Myself and Evan watched a documentary there. It's called Oil City Confidential, which was directed by Julian Temple who did a lot of like the Sex Pistols documentary, he did like the Filth and the Fury, he did a really great New York Dolls documentary as well, he did, he did some amazing stuff. 
Um, he made a film about them and he ended up making a documentary about us, which like we couldn't believe at the time as well. Really, this guy who we love his films, he's making films, it's crazy. But we watched the film with Dr. Figgard and myself and Evan, like kind of had this moment where they turned to each other and we're like, are we going to model our band on this band for the next six? Yes, we are. So like our whole career then was just like aping the Dr. Figgard thing. And so even now then as well, still I would, you know, um, myself and Ross got massively into it. And again, this was kind of music that I didn't let myself like when I was younger, but I did like it, but I didn't let myself like it. Uh, and it's how it began to mean him. Up, like, we're already really close friends anyway, but we got massively into Fountains of Wayne, stupidly. Now, obviously, Fountains of Wayne have Stacey's Mom, which is a big hit. It's 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 their biggest hit and also one of their worst songs. The Stacey. the albums they wrote, Stacey's Mom. Yeah, the, it's it's terrible. It's fine. It is what it is. It did. It, it got them to a level which is fine. But their albums are like, astonishing creations of uh, of amazing lyrics and amazing production and really simple choruses and sing-alongs. Like their, their first album is one of those amazing albums where um, it's just really simple chords, great verses, really single on courses, great guitar signs, all that stuff. It's really fun. And it's just, they should be held in the kind of like power pop analogs of like, you know, uh, power pop annals of, you know, like big star and things like that, but they're just kind of lumped in with like the, oh yeah, you're like Alien Ant Farms version of fucking like Annie. And it's again, they're in that like sort of mid 2000s or early 2000s Kerrang ream of videos that they just put on every now and then when they were stuck to put on. So they kind of fell into that world, which is a shame. But even still, like there's, you know, I think um I think I was like in I think I was watching Scrubs or something. There's a song by them called Hey, hey Julie. Hey, I love that. That but such a such a simple strum. But like, such a beautiful, yeah, it's, like cute little song. Yeah, and I think they do they do loads of really cute little songs, but also some of the lyrics are actually heartbreaking as well. And they've like five albums out there. I think there's, there's amazing tracks in all of them as well. There's some really, really good songs in them. And I like they have songs like called like Mexican Wine, the few, the few tracks called like Sink to the Bottom, which is one of the simplest, one of the one of the it should have been one of the biggest radio hits of the nineties. I mean, just for whatever reason it wasn't. It's a track called Sink to the Bottom. It's amazing as well. And um yeah, so again, even that like we, we both you know, only that recently, you know, like last two or three years or so, we both the two of us really got into big star as well. If you're a seventies power pop band who were like tired to be the next Beatles and they weren't, but the melodies are really great, simple tracks, all that sort of stuff. So no, definitely you know, I, there's just friends I have who you know, if they say this is a band you should listen to, I would, I would generally go for and listen to. And that's the, you know, the, the, um, the podcast we do ourselves is all about like we have this this, this section called "Have I Got Tunes for You" because there's, there's a satirical political show on in, in English TV called "Have I Got News for You." So it's always these we bring up new news items and talk about them, and things. Sweet, have I got tunes for you? Where you bring in an album and go, "This is an album I think everyone on this show might like to listen to, or even the listener might listen to," and things like that. So we're always sort of constantly trading stuff with, over back, which is kind of nice. Uh, but yeah, no, definitely, I've like that's like friends. Obviously, through my entire life, the biggest bands that I love, love and adore have come from other friends saying to me, that you, you should, you, you'd really like this." And what I love, what I love about the friends past music onto each other, is someone sending me a text being like, "This is the most you song ever," or "This is the like I love getting those things." People like know my taste to the point where they'll say, "You would love this." You know, like, there you go. You'll have a nice time with it. Like, oh, yeah, that's so. It's amazing. Yeah, exactly. It's really, it's really nice for me to have. So yeah, no, definitely. You know, um, all the big bands in my life that I love have come from people telling me, "I think you'd like this." sort of stuff you know what I mean so like I don't know what that says but my ability to seek out music probably not an awful lot but the friends the fact that I've got good friends who like know what I should like is kind of nice you know yeah absolutely yeah with that like so yeah I was kind of like that kind of transitioned into like um one of the things Harry Chapin used to say kind of a lot was that like you know you can you can't when it comes to music and like um you know creating social change through that music and stuff like that like you can't do it alone like you have to have like people around you who are giving you different viewpoints, you know what I mean? And like just adding to the conversation all over. So like yeah. my big question with this is um, kind of like um, music for you, like right now, and you know, the current state of the world, like how much do you think like the music you have, listen to the music you create kind of like has influence over your other things? <laughs> like, and it, that's kind of a weird question. And what I mean is like, how effective do you think it is in like, I don't know, making connections for bigger things, you know, beyond music. Yeah. Well, I think like to date, my life has largely been like dictated by the music I like and listen to. So like in essence, the music I listened to became the music that I would like want to play. And then as a result of that, it went on to sort of give me this career. So the thing is like, if I hadn't got into like the Yardbirds, Dr. Field with my friends when I was about 10, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be playing, I wouldn't be like, I wouldn't be a professional musician now. I'd be like, I'd have a forensic science degree and I'd be solving crimes and catching criminals. Whereas now I'm shit posting about a fake record label on Instagram. And so it's really like, I could be, I could be out there doing good stuff, but instead I'm wasting everyone's time and my own by doing this. But no, I think, yeah, it's, you know, oh, it's very hard to sort of quantify what, what impact you think music has in your life when it's so rooted in every, every part of your existence. There's, there's, there's not an activity I do throughout the day that isn't, set to music i think like if i'm cooking or i'm cleaning i'll have some i'll have music on in the background 
uh, probably something atrocious. But I think, you know, there's, you know, even when I'm cycling, I have stuff that, like, oh, today feels like a day where this day will, I feel like there's kind of a day that I'm having will dictate what music I listen to in a way where I'm like, oh, this song will sound good with this day. Or like, I'm cycling at a time now, it's a, it's a bright day, but I listen to that, okay, great. Or if not, if it's a shitty rainy day, if it's a cloudy overcast day, I might listen to like the Jesus and Mary chant things like that. But I think in terms of like, I kind of, you know, I sometimes have these pockets where I'm kind of like, oh, this music was rooted in someone kind of doing this or like uh, behaving like this and things like that. And then trying to think like, oh, I should let that influence my behavior in some way, shape or form to sort of feel what maybe the song was about things, which is not necessarily the healthy thing to do, to sort of pretend and live through the fantasy of the music you listen to, which is not what you do. But like I had that when I was for, in my late teens for a while, I was like, oh yeah, this song is about this, so I'll do that, to see what that, see if I can relate to it more, which never is really the case, because the point of music is meant to translate ideas that you don't have yourself any. That's kind of like, you know, and that's what I kind of like, what I really enjoy about music is the idea of being able to like translate a, a feeling or, a, or, or, or an idea or a story to someone who you're never ever going to meet ever in your life and have them relate to it. That's, that's a huge, hugely potent and powerful thing. But, you know, I think, yeah, it really, it does, it, it informs my, my day-to-day life in terms of, like, um, my uh, my approach to life is kind of musical and kind of haphazard in terms of, like, because so much of my day is spent with, like, oh, we're ordering this rehearsal, like, writing the next track. Well, like, there's, you know, if I listen to a song, because I'm a very plagiaristic writer, like, because that's the thing, I don't think, like, I, I'm not a very good musician and things like that, like, I don't have a very strong technical knowledge, no one's going to go no one's going to go, no, no one's going to die in a hill and say Peter Hammond is a great guitarist, I can, like, I do the job and it's fine. Whereas, like, as the people in the, in the band that I'm with are just so incredibly amazingly fantastic that they're just, they're, they're, they're world-beating musicians and singers and all this stuff, and I'm just kind of just there being like, hey, whatever. But I think conce- my, my strength lies in, in the conceptual sort of writing of the songs and things that and bringing them and going, okay, here's a song, and then go, cool, okay, we can expand on that to another point. So I don't have a very good technical knowledge of music. So I would hear a song and go, oh, I can, like, recognise that I could do something with that sort of framework, so I might just, like, nick that a bit mash it around, put it through phone. So like, I think the, the music that I've listened to or here, I could be like, oh, I could, I could end up using that for my own uh, profitable financial gain and releasing that as my own track. But I think there's an awful lot of, I enjoy, like, there's, there's songwriters I love, probably people like this chap called Nick Lowe, who's like, he's an, I nick everything. Everything I hear, I'm like, okay, how can I rip that off in a fun way and make it sort of new and inventive and pass it through my own prism of, of creativity and see what comes out the other end of that. And there's been times where I've written stuff and sent it over to friends or like, a, can we do this track? And they're like, that's that's literally that song, so you can't do that. So like, it's nice having that buffer that's there. But I think the, yeah. the, the music the, that I listen to on a daily basis would impact my life in terms of like, I could hear it and go, oh, like I'll do Like there's our first single that we released with this band called Don't Say a Word. And uh, it was the first yeah, track we, I like we did. I that a lot, by the way. Oh, oh thank you. Oh, I just, yeah, I, I, he sent the text, be like, I was listening to that. And I was like, oh, that's so nice. I appreciate that. That's really nice of you to do. Um, but yeah, I kind of, we did that track and I, I wrote it because I was big into a band called Sugar at the time, uh, who had a, uh, they were a big sort of 90s alternative rock band. The, the, the guy from, his name was Bob Mould, he was the guy from Husker Du, who were a big sort of 80s alternative hardcore sort of act. He went on to be in Sugar, which is a band who were kind of way more melodic, but still really crunchy and heavy, but kind of more melodic. And they had a single called If I Can't Change a Mind. And I heard that and was like, I love the, the feel of it. I love the sort of the, 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 the sentiment behind it. I love the kind of, not necessarily the production, but just sort of the, the whole, the vibe I got from the track. I really liked it. I was like, cool, I want to try and like, create my own version of that, put that out, we record, wrote the track, recorded with the band, kept it really simple, did it in the way that that band probably would have done it in terms of like, we fuzzed out guitars either side, as blistering loud as loud as it could be, all that sort of stuff. And then we ended up putting that out and it ended up going to like, the, the end up going into like, it was like a t- top 20 in the singles charts in Ireland and we were like, oh fucking Jesus Christ, it, kind of, it, it really changed. Because at the time, the band we were in, the Zen Arcade, because we're, we're only just starting out anyway, we kind of like, we were just kind of, it was a make up kind of fun band for a while. And then this track came out and suddenly because it went into the charts, it was like, it, it, it kind of brought a layer of legitimacy to it and suddenly made it feel like this, we could actually, you, this could, we could go on to do it now, but we could try and make this work actually properly because we got the return on like a, a single that it kind of, well, holy shit, we, this, this is potentially slightly viable in a small independent way. So in that instance, like I just heard a track once that I was like, cool, I'm going to write a song with that. Oh, Jason, now it's made this band that I'm in feel like it could, it could, you know, it could be something that I could do for the next few years more so it wasn't just a pastime, you know? So that's, it has an impact there as well, but it's very hard, I think, when something's so part of your day-to-day life, it's very hard to sort of identify the impact that it has on you. I think, you know, it's a really interesting question and I wish I had a better answer, but like, I think it's uh, it's very hard to sort of discern what in your life is dictated by the music you listen to when all you do is listen to it all the time. It's a bit like trying to say like, oh, what do you think breathing would be like if you didn't do it? Yeah, you know, like, hmm, that kind of thing. Without like blinking, you know? How- yeah, what, what, what do you think? Well, what's your take on that? I'm not sure. I think like, uh, like, you know, I think uh, Harry Chapin is like one of my favorite artists of all time. And his whole thing with uh, music is that like, he grew up in a time of like, um, like he was really involved in like with Pete Seeger and all of that. And like, he would talk about a lot about how like Pete Seeger would like spent 
the part of his 20s, like literally fighting fascism in like Europe and all that. So he was like, oh, how do I, you know, use this like this folk music that I come from, like all this background, this Bob Dylan stuff, even the Beatles to like a later extent comes from this like background of like political unrest, right? And like the civil rights movement and like the Beatles came over right as America was really like going through it as a country. Um, going, going, I love something, I love something up as going through it, something all of that up as they were really going through it that day. Right, I'm like, that's definitely an under, like, I'm definitely <laughs> yeah. that. But, you know, like, they, they came at, and, you know, obviously, it wasn't just, you know, that time, but that, you know, period of, like, political unrest obviously influenced the Beatles music, the Stones music, whatever, like, all the popular music from then on, really. So, yeah, it's interesting for me to kind of see, like, like, I don't know, there's so much to say about it, because like, I know when I wrote the question, I was like, I don't even know if I could answer that, like, um, because of, like my life, like, my whole thing is like, oh, I want to make the world better or whatever, like, I want to change the world or whatever. But like, Harry Chapin's whole thing was like, if you do music, if you do a thing, and you're good at it, and like, people enjoy watching you do it, like, then you should do that, like, in an area for, you know, that day, and you know, have someone else do it tomorrow, and like, ca- like keep coming back next week and next year and the next ten years, and like, that's how you kind of like when you get people involved in like a concert. Like a concert is a perfect social event, kind of. Mm-hmm. That's not like totally. I don't know. It's not. It's, it's not, not a bar. You know what I mean? You're not there just to get drunk. You're there to like listen to the music, the music and like yeah. the people and blah 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 blah. But his yeah. whole thing with that was like if you, you know. If you, if you have people come into concerts and you have people making these connections and like, you know, you have people talking to each other, eventually people will realize that like uh, basic needs like food, water and shelter have to be met. <laughs> you know what I yeah, mean? Like, totally. Yeah, yeah. And can be met. His, his whole thing was like, if we solve hunger, like we can solve everything else because if people aren't hungry, then they can actually fight for their rights. So totally. yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. it's funny because I think there's an awful lot of parallels there with your man Harry Chippen with a guy I really like. Well, I think I think yeah. I think it maybe ties into the thing you were talking about before about like the impact music can have on like culture and things. I think you know. I think music has re- has a massive impact on culture. Yeah. In terms of an art sense, when it's not trying to, when it's just being right. what, when it's just being, if someone's just following their natural creative instinct, it has an impact on culture. Where like I said, the whole Beatles thing, they weren't like out there to like write political songs, but ended up becoming countercultural icons because they represented a carefreeness that wasn't allowed people weren't allowed to buy into prior to that and things like that. Uh, same with like a lot of, and that's what like even when you see, I think there's you can see stuff now where like you know, there's been contrived attempts to like be uh, be culturally significant, and they just they never work, they never work at all. Whereas like I think if you're if you're thinking of like bands that are trying to like inspire change and, and enact change in, in a socio economic landscape that they weren't like that they didn't like at the time, you think of like a band like The Clash, who like as it were, they were very they were very visual, they were very visually and vocally all about we this is not okay and we don't want this and this is not what it is. Um, and it's you know the songs were kind of rooted in that and all this stuff. And I think in some way they did. They they, they kind of they, they they used their platform, which I think is what the, the, the shape point you're making as well. It's like having like a platform. Like if you if you have a room of 300 people who are all hanging on your every word, you do have a bit of a responsibility to say what you think is is really. We also have to know exactly what you're saying. And there is a bit of a weird interview with the Clash, where they uh, there's a, there, I think I don't know if they're on like a political show or a talk show or something like that, where they kind of ask them like, okay, so what do you actually want to happen? What do you want to to be the next thing and they're kind of they're kind of bit they're caught a bit they're like uh they're trying to be man paul simon is kind of like um well we just want it to be be better you know i'm not saying the class but it's i'm not saying that at all but kind of they, they kind of joe summer came out and was like look we said we didn't we didn't ever say what we wanted we just said we didn't want this we didn't offer an answer we were just kind of given out which is like which was enough as well you just needed someone a popular band being like this is not okay and then leaving it up to someone to take the front of that but there's an actor who i think followed up very well on that He's in much in the same way the Harry Chapin thing was like a chap from England called Billy Bragg. You ever hear Billy Bragg at all? No, I've heard he's this. Name, but... He's name, yeah. Well, he, he was he's this singer songwriter from 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 England, and he at the height of the sort of Thatcherism in, in England in the early eighties, mid eighties, and things like that he was this absolute hardcore diehard socialist who was like this. None of this is okay at all. And so much of his, he toured, he, he, his tours would be based around working men's clubs and he would be playing to minors and he'd be on the front lines of benefits. He'd be all, and he would constantly spent all of his life, even still now, he's still a very, very active uh, campaign for social, socialist change and all that sort of stuff. And um, his music's great. Like it's some, some of it's really good. Like it's a great track I think you'd like called Between the War. Between the Wars, sorry. Uh, it's a really, really good track. It's really potent. Kind of, again, he, I think he, he's also the, 
he's the kind of the key holder for the Woody Guthrie estate. Like he's kind of looks after all that. And he's written, he's done something Woody Guthrie. He does these albums, he's done a series of albums with Wilco, the band Wilco, where they just do covers of Woody Guthrie songs. And they're really, there's some really good, really good albums. But uh, he's really rooted in all that. And his whole thing has been like, he's to, to the detriment of his professional career because there's so many times he's just been knocked back. Because everyone's like, you're just like a champagne socialist. You had a hit and you're still playing for minors. Oh, you're, you're fake and everything. Like that. And so he's been lambasted every few years or so. The country just rounds him and is like, no, you're wrong. You're a twat. You've been rocking for him for so long. You're, you've got a big house. Fuck you. But he's still so rooted in him. He has this vision that he thinks he wants. And I, and I think it's correct. I, I align a lot with what he thinks as well. I think it's really powerful, potent stuff that, that, he, that he comes out with. And it's, it's again, it just makes sense. It's like, well, yeah, people probably shouldn't be hungry. People probably should have a way to live. People probably should have a basic equity wage. And to be able to like, live on the money that the minimum wage should, you should be able to live on it rather than have to scrape by on it and things like that. And it's all very sensible stuff. And it's, but as a, but, but he toes that very well with like, as I say, he's done so much of that, like he's, um, the 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 whole time like he was very involved in the whole minor strikes and as I said he did a tour once I think where he played in like two hundred worker men's clubs just trying to highlight the sort of the the the, the, the sort of the, the lack of ability for people to survive under Thatcher's Britain and just the, the struggle that was going on there for all these families as well who were like it was single income families who were being paid very little and also then had their jobs taken away and then were also had to strike it was a kind of how do we support these people that have to strike and can't make money because of the trying to strike against this the stuff that Thatcher was doing but also how do we get the money because what they're doing is right. But also he was like very, so there's a weird sympathy with people who cross the picket line because it's like they have to provide for their family. Yeah. How do we get them in need where they can provide for their family without having to work under an oppressive, horrible regime that is designed to destroy them from the inside out? And again, that seems pretty sensible. <laughs> but you'd be surprised people who are like, Billy Bragg wants to take all your money and that's not the case at all. You know, same with like, and look, he's a, he can be a very divisive figure. But someone like Bob Geldof, who I think, you know, at his core tried really hard to do the right thing and to the sacrifice and to the detriment of his own career, not so much of Gilbert, because he went on to do an awful lot of stuff as well. But as I say, I think when you're willing to sacrifice your own professional, uh, your own professional career path, and the way, like I said, Billy Bright could have moved into being a way bigger folk act who just did like because he wrote some massive hits as well, he had some great tracks. He Johnny Marys recorded him all the time. He was the and he toured with the Smiths. He was doing really well. But then also was like, I cannot let these what I see as injustices injustices go on in the world uh, when I have an ability and a platform to do so. Um, which I think is very impressive. Same Bob Geldof as well. Like he did, he did not lot of stuff as well. and was very vocal about it. And to the point where, like now, still Bob Geldof can't walk down the street in Dublin without someone shouting at him, like, "Oh yeah, do you still want my fucking money?" and things like that. Like it's kind of he tried his best. But yeah. um, and then on the flip side of that, I think there's, and I think I mentioned to you an email that I sent last night. There's a band from Northern Ireland called the Undertones, who yeah. were came from a place, a place called Derry, which was that was at the very high of the troubles in the late seventies, early eighties. Uh, which is a massive period of religious civil unrest, and it was a, it was a huge thing worldwide. Really it's just, that, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, so it's, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure how much of that's actually like told over in American schools about what was going on over here. So I'm not sure if that's if it's a big thing over there. Um, but yeah, it was a huge thing. And this band were a, like a punk band who were really influenced by the Ramones, and they were coming out around the time when you had the Clash and the right. Sex Pistols and the Stiff Little Fingers and all these like the adverts and these hardcore political bands who were being like out there roaring and shouting with like placards and things like that. And the undertones were coming from right bang in the middle of the biggest civil unrest in this side of the world, in the West, in this in this end of Europe and things like that. And they, I don't know if it was a conscious decision or they were just like, this is part of the fabric of our lives and we want to ignore it. What we would rather focus on is our actual interpersonal issues with our relationships with our, with our, with our girlfriends and boyfriends, with our with going to school dances and going being teenagers or like having enough money to buy chocolate bars, things like that. They actually have a song on their second album called More Songs About Chocolate and Girls and things like that because they're like, this is, the, this is the stuff that concerns us more than anyone else. And uh, they were just, it was a really nice, I think uh, it was sort of weirdly poetic in a way. Uh, it was a bigger political move, I think, um, to ignore the, the, the streets getting blown up and car bombs being thrown about the place and windows getting blown in. Like they tell stories about how like before recording sessions, they would like, they would be lifted out of the bed because a bomb had gone off in the street and things like that. And their reaction to that was to just, well, look, we'd rather create a world where we can live and have fun and things like that. And I think it was a bigger political move to ignore all that and write about what they wanted to write about as because they were teen, they were 17, 18, 19 at the time. They had bigger yeah. things on their mind than the world ending outside, which I think is really cool. And yeah. I think it was a bigger political move than kind of the empty sloganeering of maybe bands like the Stiff Little Fingers, who I think are a great band and their album is really great, but just kind of roaring and shouting didn't get much done. Whereas the, the undertones in a weird way kind of became weirdly kind of a unifying force between, uh, now again, I'm speaking from not a prism of experience because I wasn't born at the time, but from what I've read and what I've seen is that a weird kind of like unifying force because it was just like, well, look, there's this great music coming out of Derry, President Catholics were like, this is great music, we enjoy this. And they kind of became a unifying force between the two opposing sides. Same as like there was a boxer from Clonus, which was right bang on the border called Barry McGuigan. And he became the world lightweight boxing champion 
uh, which was a huge thing. And he was from right on the border in the middle of all this sort of the height of all this stuff going on, this, this the civil unrest and things that. And he became a weird totem for peace for the Protestants. And Catholics were both like, look, can we just leave the fight to McGuigan? There was a weird pride that like he came from us and he's off and he's, he's the best in the world at what he can do. Why are we fighting? Let him do it. That's all around. He can just, you know, be a boxer and that's kind of fine. So it's weird. Like uh, the, the point of the undertones, I think, is being like a band who, as I say, refused to address what was going on in the front door because to them it wasn't, first of all, it wasn't artistically engaging. So they didn't like sacrifice their artistic vision because they're like, we know what we want to write about. This is what concerns us more. And uh, I think it's a really nice kind of like uh, a, a weirdly offensive stance to take and be like, yeah. we can't we can't help but be confronted with this imagery and this bloodshed all the time or we refuse to acknowledge it and do what we want to do so just because so it, it, the whole point of this was just to get in people's heads and like disrupt them and they're like we're not going to let you disrupt us with this because we want to write this music regardless and to me it's some of the finest music that's coming out of Ireland is the undertones music because it comes from a true really fun really smart but also kind of weirdly naive in a charming way perspective despite the fact that if you know what's going on in the background as a recording this album it's just absolute hellfire all the time which I think is really impressive and again it's weirdly anachronistically we're sort of like the, the, the shape of thing like if you have a platform you should speak about it so much the undertones had the best platform the best backdrop to speak about this from and didn't which said so much more about what what people actually wanted which was for this to just go away and it not be there anymore you know which i think was huge yeah i think like some people i think a lot of what people don't talk about like the reason the beatles were so what were the beatles is because they were like literally 17 18 19 year old kids coming to America, like, like they were like, it's so crazy to think about. Cause like all we had really here before the whole British invasion, we had, you know, like some kind of punk music, but we had like Elvis, you know what I mean? We had like, our like, our allowed centimeters of hip swaying, you know, yeah. like, we had to leave room for Jesus still. But then the Beatles came over and they were like, we're bigger than Jesus. We're, you know, we do this stuff and we did like, we're not going to answer interview questions seriously. Like, no, we're not going to do that. Cause we're children, but everyone was like, Oh my God, they're, not taking it like Elvis would answer questions like, yeah, I am, I am going into the military. Like he would, he's such a like, yeah. he was like a, such a safe, um, like extension of like, okay, like get your jiggles out with him. You know what I mean? Yeah. But when the Beatles, yeah, yeah. You know, all the young, like he, like even Elvis was like on the older side at that point, the Beatles were young, like actually like representing like an energy of like the American yeah, totally, people. Yeah. And that's where I think the, the, that's where I think the power of irreverence in a band is huge as well. If you can seem to be like, if you can be on a world stage and you're laughing and joking and having the crack, that to me says way more about what you think about an establishment more so than if you're railing against it. You know, if you're kind of if you're funny and be like, I have no respect for this. That's why I'm taking the piss out of you more so than grabbing mics and shouting and roaring. And kind of more even like, I don't care about this. This means nothing to me. So who gives a shit? I think that's really powerful and it's really hard thing to do as well because when confronted with something maybe you don't like, it's very hard. I think yeah. the, the best thing to do, it's a bit like a bully, but the best thing to do is like just to like laugh at a bully. It's so hard to do that but if you can it's way more potent than actually you know taking action but again obviously action has to be taken sometimes as well of course i'm not saying everyone should just laugh and get over it you know but uh yeah i know it's, it's very interesting again even like studying the the, the 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 social dynamics of how people enact change in music and such so, so I, I would be interested to see like a graph or if, if someone could do it for like what about bands really like had a vision and had, 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 had a voice and had a talk action i would be interested to see i wonder what the graph of like impact to ratio of like of, of what they said it'd be interesting to see what what, what actually was was the case or like, even like you've got bands like black flag as well who were very political and said as well you know and like we're a big college band who i think informed a lot of people. and again i think not so much maybe necessarily the bands and actually not really change but i think they were probably the bands the favorite bands of people who went on to be like well i had this political idea that came from this band and i know i have the facilities to make that happen in a congressional way or in a you know in a, in a political sphere that i that i that I associate with you know yeah Oh, so I just, I just realized we've been talking for like an hour and 15. So I get, let's wrap. Like, oh my God. Wrap, really? I know I could talk about with, like about music with you all day, honestly. Um, oh, that's great. Thank you. Yeah. But let's see. Okay, so, <laughs> the last few things I want to like just talk about is, you know, we said we talked a little bit about like guilty pleasure and like fuck guilty pleasure concepts. Right. But like, yeah. you, like if you have like three songs that you would kind of label as like guilty pleasure and then just also a song that's just been stuck in your head. All week? Yeah. Uh, I would say, so again, as I said, we've talked about the, the concept of guilty pleasures not necessarily being very true, because again, we, we've both broken to the barrier of you just like what you like and it's fine. Uh, we actually have, on the on the podcast we do, we do a segment called Guilty Hatreds, which is bands you feel bad about not liking, which I find is kind of interesting, people are like, because oh. there are bands who are like, I feel bad, like one of them I was led up, like, I do feel bad for not liking them, because they're such a huge cultural thing, I should like them, but I just don't. And someone else I know was like, they were on the show as well, and they said, oh, 
I don't know, like I should like them, but I don't, is the Velvet Underground. I'm like, oh God, that's a really great one. You know, things like that. Like, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a good one to think about. Um, but yeah, I would say Guilty Pleasures, I would say something like, you know, Huey Lewis in the News, uh, like really? Quick to be Square. Yeah, you know, that. Like, I, again, I, you know, in some ways, I'm just like, I just love the band. I think they're great. But How like, can I, I do. Talk I, you about that because you said you did the Ghostbusters theme song when you were younger. You know, like, that's a, that riff is taken from. Rip off. Lewis song. From, yeah, from uh, One and New Drug. Yeah, I know. Really, yeah, it's taken from One and New Drug, which is mad. But I, so like, I, I have a long-standing association with Huey Lewis in the news because he sings, now you, you might know the film, he sings the opening track of Oliver and Company. Do you remember that oh. Disney film with the little orange cat? He sings the yeah, first track Billy of that. Joel. Billy Joel plays the dog in that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yep. I love that, it. That, that film was the film that I watched like every day until I was about six. It was one of those films I just watched all the time. So I know that, and that's why like, I had this Huey Lewis obsession for years because I was like, that's the voice from the start of that film. So yeah. I just only hit to be square or like, you know, one of those tracks, uh, the Heart of Rock and Roll or something like that. Like, I have one of those Hulu's tracks, I think. Is only another Guilty Pleasure, and it's only kind of a recent one, and it's come out, of, it's absolutely blindside to me, and it's come out of absolutely nowhere, is Payphone by Maroon 5. <laughs> That's oh absolutely God. destroyed me over the last one. You know what? Uh, I'll go ahead and say it, though. I feel like that album might be the last time Maroon 5 was good. And not good, not good. Like I mean, they've kind of like sold out a little to me, and maybe that's wrong. But like I heard yeah, the other day, and I was like, that's not Maroon Five. <laughs> like, I can't believe I can't believe how long Maroon Five have been around, though. I know. Like it's crazy. They've almost been around like twenty years now, which is fucking. My mad. question is, where's Train? Train? Oh, the band Train. Yeah, what happened to them? Yeah. yeah. It was like Maroon Five and Train were like the bands, and then I don't know what happened to Train. But uh, there was one track. <laughs> oh, it's amazing. The, again, the melody is great, regardless of the production around. I think the melody is great, and that, that's all it does for me. Another track, I kind of guilty hatred, but also I have no shame in liking it either as well, is a track by a, a, a Arcana called So Little Time, which is the theme song for the Mary Kate Nash TV show So Little Time. But it, as a track itself, is great, despite it being a theme song for like a largely forgotten 2000s show. I think it's great. Um, I also have, I mentioned it already, but it's there as well for, for Guilty Hatreds or Guilty Pleasures, like Beautiful Soul with Jesse McCartney again, the likes of like fucking, even like, even the love story with Taylor Swift, I've, that's a huge one for me as well, like it's, even though it's a, it's a mess of a track, I know. It's the, see, it's the key change at the end, when the harmonies come in at the key change at the end, destroys my soul, yeah. I've got a theory that like, if you can do a pop song really well and it catches on and you have a key change in that pop song, it's gonna win a Grammy. Really? Like, it might, like I have, I just have a bit like, Oh, what was it? Like, one of my songs, what's it called? What a Fool Believes by the Doobie Brothers. Oh, yeah. That song is insane because he, like, changes keys in the chorus. And then he goes, like, he goes back to the original key, back in the verse. And he won a Grammy that year for that. And I was like, hmm. And so yeah. I did research, and I was like, hmm, maybe if you just have something, like, interesting, like a key change or, like, a different... Like one one of the Grammy winners one year was like a seven eight beat. It's the song "Get Closer" by Linda Ronstadt. And oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It has like a it's one beat. It's not a regular, like eight beat measure. It's off by one, but you don't realize it until you like listen to it. But it won a Grammy, That's so I'm like maybe if you just change like if you do something like that. Yeah, well even there's there's a great track by Squeeze called "Up the Junction," which is like was a yeah. massive hit. One like yeah, you know the track. It has a key. It, you don't even know it. It has a key change for like the middle eight changes key. And then it, it goes into another verse, which is like a key up. And then it manages to somehow go back down to the original key, but sound like it's going up. It's crazy how they do it. It's so good. Yeah, and that's one of those tracks where like, there's no chorus in it at all, but it was a massive hit. How did they do that? It's just rhyming in couplets over and over and over again, and there's no repeat of the chorus. It's amazing. But uh, and then one song I've had in my head all week, I think, is uh, Save It For Later by The Beast, um, because I, I moved house in the last sort of week or so, and uh, uh, I went from one place of Dublin to another, and um, it's it's a song I always listen to in periods of like transition. If I'm doing something big, like when I left home, I, I listened to this track when I was like flying home. We, we finished, I think, the last tour we did, the last gig we did was in America, and when we were flying home. We uh, we um, I listened to that on the plane. It, it's just always a song that I that I do like when I feel like a, a moment of it. I always put that song on because I just feel like it soundtracks those moments really really well. Not because of the little content or anything like that. It just it, 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 the feel of the song is really sort of conducive to me, feeling like I'm doing something momentous with my life sort of thing. And uh, it's one of those songs that I've, I've seen in films a few times and I was like, oh God, it's, it, it soundtracks that really, really well. And uh, I'm going to sort of create a situation where it soundtracks bits of my life as well, which I can, it's, it's, it's a really nice song. And again, I have no idea what the song is even about. 
the lyrics don't really make much sense things like that it just seems to be a vague sort of like pining love song but it, it's, it's a really nice song to me i think i really enjoy it oh well, thanks and then oh the final oh gosh the final question um so like if you've got i think you know this is something like i i really because if i had like asked myself this i don't think i could answer it but like if you have one album that you want like everyone to listen to like you think everyone should hear and if there's not yeah. one no if you've got five that you really like that's See, the thing is I, I was going to say like, I, I was going to limit myself to one and then when you said five I was like, okay with five that means that that's that, 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 it's almost harder to say five than it is to say one yeah. i'll start with i'll start with one that i think i don't know how well it'll go because they're they're, they're already sort of parochial english band but uh, I think have applicated. I think I sort of picked an album that I think summed up what you kind of like we were talking about earlier on as well. I think in terms of like bands and the platform, and also just being a fun pop band to listen to as well and things like that. It's a band called the House Martins. Um, yeah, with an album called Lond- London Nil, like London Zero Hole Four, as if it's a football game sort of thing. And um, they're a, they're they're a band where like they, I think the best way to pitch them is like they're like the Smiths but happier. Uh, they have the same kind of like acerbic wit and like scathing edge with like powerful indictments of modern culture and like political satire and that, but passed through a prism of like fun and covered in like a veneer of kind of like poppy sheen that you don't even realize you're listening to songs about destabilizing the government or the advancement of like a socialist utopia, but it's also fun to sing along to as well. The one of those albums where like it's really it's it's fun to listen to in the background while you're like hoovering and it's like yeah you can listen and it's fun on a surface level and then you can properly listen to it and get like internally radicalized as well and it's a it's it's, it's, yeah. it's but it's also it's it's not it's not really blunt either it's very smart with its kind of subversions of what's going on like there's the, one of the big hits of the song but happy hour which is all about trying to like kind of disrupt the day-to-day life of like of like of like working individuals in England in the late 70s early 80s it's all about how like you know as soon as you get happier everyone just gets drunk and forgets that their job is shite and things like that it um, but it's a really happy pop song. And you think like, oh, it sounds great. I want to go to the pub, but also it's about <laughs> going with pub culture is ruining the country and things like that. You know, it's it's, it's there, there, there's so many sort of weird sort of like um incongruent stuff going on that's great. And again, the songs are really well written. Um, they're they're big sort of Marxist socialist band as well, but also had like massive mainstream hits. Mainstream in terms of like in England, they're on like any label in England and things like that. Um, and just were really well respected and um. The singer Paul Heaton has this amazing voice, one of these ranges that can just go from like really low, fun, warbly stuff to high pitched kind of squealing. They do a few soul songs as well, they're great. They also do this, they, they, one of their biggest hits. They were like this guitar jangle pop band that had to do like little like simple riffs. And oh, sorry, yeah, no, the big thing with this band is the bass player went on to be Fat Boy Slim. Oh, which is like so, yeah, yeah, oh. that's he, start, he started in a band where they were like knitted cardigans and played, and then he went on to do like rock a fella skank and things like that, which is crazy. But um, they had a massive hit called Caravan of Love, which is a cover of... Oh, I need to figure out the band's name. Sorry, it was like Caravan of Love by... Uh, but they did like a... So they were famous for being a, a like jumpy little fun guitar band. Um, I guess the Isley Brothers, I think, wasn't it? Yeah, I think it was. Um, or Isley Dust Brothers. Uh, who were famous for like having like simple guitars, one guitar, jangly stuff, bit of punch, nice puppy drums, things like that. And then did a cover of Caravan of Love, totally a cappella, all four-part harmonies, and it's... It was our biggest hit, and like a lot of the fans were like, "This is much a band." Or like, "Oh fuck you guys!" But it was a really weird hit to come in after you know her. But just a really good. Their, their first album is a sublime, sublime listen. And there's not a track I would skip. I think maybe the third track is a track I would skip. The thing is flagged. It's not. It's a, to me, it's not too good. But the whole album is just non-stop single after single after single, but also slamming indictments of modern British culture at the time. It's it's really really great. Um, a few of the ones I, I'll just I'll give a quick pitch. I mentioned already the first Fountains Away album again. Great album to just sort of sit back and listen to. And not think too much about it. But then also if you want to think about it, you can get really kind of deep into it and things that which is kind of fun. Um the Breeders first album, Last Splash, the, the one that has that cannonball hit on it, that's a really good, like crusty album that has amazing sounds on it and things like that. Um there's the Bell did you ever listen to Bell and Sebastian? You ever hear of Bell and Sebastian? Oh yeah, I've actually seen um what's that movie? God help the girl. The whole like there's a little niche. Have you heard of it? I think it's like no, a no. Scottish production or something. I've based it's um Oh God, I forget the girl. Uh, you know, have you ever seen Skins? Yes. Yeah, yeah. It, that girl Cassie is in it. Um, and she also oh. But it's like a, a, it's called God Help the Girl, and it's like a Bell and Sebastian, I guess, cover movie. I haven't seen it in a while. I'll send it to you. It's um. Dude, dude, yeah, that sounds great. I don't know about that. No, they're a great band. They did an album called um, The Life Pursuit, which again, it's really, it's it's sort of weird music that is like. It holds up a mirror to sort of culture that like you didn't know you were related to until you hear about it. Like it's all about it's sort of the kitchen sink drama. Same as Squeeze, they're one of those bands and the Kinks as well, who just were great at being like, this is 
what culture looks like to us and this is how we see it and then you hear lines you're like they're so right I, I would never even think of that but I relate to it so much and I've seen it in my life every single day I think that's you know what I mean uh, Dave and Alvin they're called Life Street which is great they have a song about doing, like, doing, the, doing the laundry called uh, The Blues Are Still Blue mm. really fun really great rock and the lyrics are great really fun to listen to some great lines and that. I would say one of the one I will mention I've only got two left I think so it would be very quick um, Kirsty McCall The Stiff Years so this is a kind of a collection of her singles. She's a great singer. She's the woman who does the she does the female part, the female duet on Fairy Tale in New York. That's kind of what she's known for mostly. But she also did a lot, she did a version of Billy Bragg's song called New England had a big hit with that. She also had a, a great sort of like country hit. You might not like if you're not a country arena person fan, but she did a nice sort of like simple country version of a track called There's a guy who works down the chip shop swears he's Elvis, which is such a long title. I think it's great. But she had an amazing collection of singles on Stiff Records, which was this great record label that just let acts do whatever they wanted to do in the late 70s. Um, and there's some amazing songs in that. Again, it's just a compilation of her singles, but it's a really good summation of her of her as an artist. And then I would say maybe my last one, I'd say maybe Graham Coxon. He had an album called Love Travel. He's a guitar player from Blur. Um, oh, I was going to say he sounded from, like familiar, but I wasn't... Yeah, yeah, but he had this solo album in like 2006 called Love Travels at Illegal Speeds. And it's just really fun. It's really thick, chuggy guitar, simple lyrics. And it's it's weird because like a lot of the guitar stuff we did in Blur was really arty and kind of weirdly, you know, weird sounds kind of nowhere and really sort of progressive and things like that. In this, he's just chugging away, having fun playing. And some of the, some of the choruses are great. It's a really simple, easy listen album, you know? Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. Oh, oh my die. God. I have like so much new music to listen to now. Um, I feel like, because I've like, the only music I really haven't gotten into is, is kind of like, Blur and like smashing, but like I haven't gotten into this like late kind of 90s stuff. When someone's like recommending music, I'm like, Jesus Christ, they're gonna judge me so hard on what they want to give them. It's, it's so tough to be like, because I don't listen to now, but I'm also like, well, but what's actually objectively good that I've listened to before most of what I'm just vibing on now? It's very hard to kind of figure out, but uh, yeah, I hope, I hope we like some of that. Um, uh, but yeah, I think that's I think that's all five of them. Uh, whatever, oh, actually, if you take the time, there's a, a yeah. band from Jakarta that I came across called Girl Gang G O R L G A N G. Again, really simple, kind of airy songs. There's kind of like a bit of a cure element, like the sort of re- reverby kind of guitars, some really sweet melodies. But there is a there's a track of theirs, and I can't think of the name of it, but they accidentally lift the melody from the song at the end of the Lizzie McGuire film, and I don't think they know that they've done it. Do you know the oh, oh, oh. I don't know, oh. do that big, do that high damage. They accidentally lift it, and I'm like, I don't know if I should like tell the word, but uh, it's it, it. The track is great anyway. There's some really nice sort of light airy sort of songs that I think are great. And they're just I've never heard of a band coming from Jakarta before. It's really good to listen to. Yeah, oh just, just, Thank you for all these like recommend. I feel like I have like so much to listen to now for the next week. Um, oh, great, okay. <laughs> we have such similar music tastes too. In like the first place, I'm glad to meet. Yeah, you no, before. crazy. <laughs> You know, but uh, yeah. I mean, be- 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 Beatles fans are so hard to come by. There's so oh, few Beatles yeah. fans. It's so hard to find. Yeah, they're so underground. I know. It's like no. But, uh, find it, finding a Bowling for Soup fan is a huge. I was at a friend's sort of college party there, like maybe two or three weeks ago. Like they just finished college and they were having a party at home. And uh, they, I think it was Girl, the Bad Guys Want to come on. And there was only three of us in the dance floor. And like, one of them was my friends. Like, we knew this. And someone else came on. And they're like, it's just BFS. And I was like, I'm so glad we were using like the initials now. That means someone knows their shit. And they're like, it's a bit of BFS. But yeah, but thank you. So this has been really fun. No, um, thanks for having me on. It was great. I like any excuse to chat, Shy. I love it. It's great. I, I really appreciate being, being allowed to come on. That's great. I, again, listening to the first episode, it sounded great. Really enjoyed some of the insight in that. So yeah, it was really cool. All right. Well, that's it for me this week. Thanks again to Pete for coming in, and make sure you guys go check out Zen Arcade's music. They're on tour all the time, so they're probably coming to you soon. I will add a link to their music in the description below. As always, I'm adding every song we talk about to the playlist as much as I can, and that link will also be available below. As this is my third episode, I would like to take the chance to reach out and ask my audience, if it exists, for comments, questions, and suggestions for the podcast. How am I doing? Feel free to leave a comment below and let me know what you think. I'd also love to get in touch with any musicians you can recommend who you think would enjoy this podcast. So if you make music and would like to be a part of this or know someone who would, also leave a comment and let me know, please. Uh, and, and of course, thanks to all of you for listening. I'm Abby Hanna, and join us next time for another episode of Name Five Albums. And the doctor said, give them just bad music. It seems to make them feel just fine.